Okay, thank you. You can if you want to. Okay. Just like to need to let me know. If I get pinched in here. Yeah. This time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the following interview is conducted as part of Georgia State University's Activist Women Oral History Project. I am Morna Gerard and I am interviewing Mary Finn. It is June 28, 2012 and we are at Georgia State University. Um, today, Mary, I'd really like to focus on the work you've been doing around um, the issue of child sex trafficking. Okay. Um, first of all, can you tell me how you uh, first became aware of the issue? Mm -hmm. Um, I think I was aware of the issue um, starting in, it would be the mid-1990s, and there were some reports, at that time we referred, you know, it was really an area we called child prostitution, for, which now is a term that's fallen out of disfavor, and appropriately so. But, uh, so I became aware of some data that was coming out from some Bureau of Justice Statistics reports by David Finkelhor and others who were doing some research out of the family violence research um, unit out in New Hampshire, University of New Hampshire. Um, and so they were putting out some statistics on the rates uh, at which uh, juveniles were being arrested and, uh, and charged and prosecuted for prostitution. And um, then in, I think, probably again about the late 1990s, the city of Atlanta, there was a, a judge, um, Nina Hickson, who was a juvenile court judge with Fulton County, who became a very a vocal and uh, very active in trying to address what she, what she presented as some alarming numbers of young girls who were coming into her court who had, if they weren't in for prostitution charges, um, they maybe were charged for violation of curfew or disorderly conduct or running away, but in their backgrounds there was a common uh, theme of this experience with being uh, forced into prostitution, uh, whether it was due to a, a person, an, an adult, kind of taking control of them and requiring that, or whether they did it as a result of circumstances that they were in, that they needed to get shelter or food or safety in some way, and so they were willing to exchange sex for that. Uh, and then I think the early, there was some data that was coming out of um, the National Institute of Justice where they began looking at child prostitution, and we started having this conversation about the term, and. Were these really offenders or were they victims? Were they delinquents? Were they really dependent youth or neglected youth? And so in the context of all that, Atlanta became recognized by the Federal Bureau of Investigation based on the arrest statistics as one of the top 15 cities in the U.S. And so that got the local community, particularly through Judge um, Hickson and some other concerned women in the community, to begin to draw attention to it. So what can we do in the city of Atlanta? Uh, to try to address this, and uh, and again, their their I think their initial involvement in it began a conversation that spread outside of Atlanta into other major cities about how are we really perceiving this group of young women, and how is it best to regard them, and what do they need, and um, to try to bring that lens shift away from seeing them as offenders and perpetrators of a crime to being actually victims, and what that would mean, and how we could devise a response that would address it from that approach. So I would say the mid-90s ninety or mid -90s and, and then obviously into the early 2000s when there's just tremendous public attention and a movement away from child prostitution to them being referred to as um, uh, um, exploited children, sexually exploited children, to now where we have kind of lumped all of that into this area of child trafficking which would involve labor and sex and um, other types of when you When you first um, became aware of it, did you have um, an emotional response to it, as to, to what was going on? I did, um, to a degree. I mean, I'm, I've, I've studied some dark sides of um, our lives, and, and uh, so, and in my own experience in working with youth in early in my career as a child care worker, I knew of sexual abuse being, of, you know, 
probably the most hidden secret we have in our, in our culture. And uh, so I know that a lot of individuals in, who are adults now have experienced sexual abuse as children. But to see it um, occur at, um, with a, really a, at the level that it appeared to be happening was disturbing. Um, and, and to look at it from both an international and a national perspective, or to look at the domestic picture, and to realize that the roots of so much um, difficulty that people experience in their lives are often based on these early um, pre-adolescent, adole even early adolescent experiences that they have. And that, that, that uh, we have to be able to intervene at that point to put them on a different pathway, a pathway of success and not a pathway towards delinquency and adult criminality. And so it did affect me in a way emotionally based upon my experiences that I had with youth and working with them and, and through child care, that it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a difficult issue, it's definitely a difficult issue. And how did you uh, personally become involved in working with the issue? Um, part of it was the um, National Institute of Justice had um, put out a call for proposals to do research evaluation of the city of Atlanta's response to commercial sexual exploitation of children, or CSEC. And um, the city of Atlanta and Fulton County had received some funding from the federal government uh, to respond to the problem and build what they called a community coordinated response. And what the National Institute of Justice wanted to know, which is kind of the research arm of the U.S. Department of Justice, was, well, what's been accomplished are there lessons that we can learn from studying cities like Atlanta? And we had a partner city as well, New York, that we were funded at around the same time, that they hoped that we could gather some lessons so that uh, kind of in recognition that um, while these 14 cities may have been highlighted within, within the official data for having a high number of arrests, that underlying those numbers was probably a much larger population of youth who may be experiencing this and never coming into contact with law enforcement in the justice process. So in response to that RFP, um, and that because I'm an evaluation researcher, and in all honesty, when I went into looking at the problem, I didn't really get my head around it emotionally as I, because I'm like, well, it's evaluation research and I do evaluation research. And so evaluating you know, the response to this would be no, not unlike evaluating the response to other things I've examined, so violence against women and you know, children witnessing violence, I mean, all of that. But it really is different. <laughs> and, and, I think, and I think I've learned that, um, that it, it was one of those things that once I got into it and I began to hear, as, as a researcher, all the conversations that were going on across all of the agencies that touched the lives of these youth, and how many of them had very different perceptions, so they were talking about the same population. I found myself getting it sometimes very angry, and other times just tremendously hopeful, um, and other times just wanting to just hug every person in the room for their, for their bravery and their willingness to kind of give voice to this issue that was so impacting um, our community. Um, so yeah, it uh, <laughs> it was quite the. Can you give examples of um, the different the different groups with different views? Yeah, I, I think that overall, when in in studying the agencies and trying to understand, I mean, our approach was there were thirty plus community agencies, and these were all agencies that had been identified because they touched children's lives in some way. So healthcare, education, um, obviously law enforcement, juvenile justice, uh, child welfare, child protection. Um, so the range of areas. And what I noticed in the meetings that we observed was that um, probably much like I approached it as an evaluation researcher, that this is simply an issue that I can study in um, bringing my kind of my scientific, empirical, objective lens to. I think they brought their agency's perspectives to the problem. And their first strategy was to try to figure out, well, how does this particular 
youth look like the other youth that we touch, right? To try to peg them into the whole of all the other services that they provided. And part of what was interesting to observe was that over the course of the conversation that those agencies had with each other and that, that we were able to observe, they began to understand kind of the uniqueness of this particular experience for these youth that didn't allow them to be easily dealt with through either the child protective services realm or the juvenile justice realm um, or even the healthcare realm that their needs were and their lives were just far more complicated and layered and the the not that any you know not, not that any kind of issue with youth is easy to fix but these individuals brought in just multiple um, issues of you know failure in school and sometimes sexual abuse in the home and um, just violence within their communities and it, it's just just so many things that they seemed like they were of greatest risk. Be I mean, on, on risk scales, they would be at such a high end. And then how do you address it? And how do you, for a youth who's, say, 12 or 13 years old, who's had this experience of being exploited by someone, selling their sex for, their body for sex, for money for another person, how do you intervene in a way with a commitment across all of those agencies to take them to adulthood? Because that's really what you're talking about for many of these youth, because there isn't a home placement. There's not a safe home to put them back into. And it may be that home and the risks in that home that led them to run away in the first place. So all of that, um, so those perspectives came, and, and so you would bring a solution to the table as someone involved in juvenile justice um, that says, well, they shouldn't be held in our Division for Youth facilities if they're brought in on truancy or violating curfew because their primary issue is that they're, involved, they're being victimized in this way, and this isn't the place for them, but there isn't any other place for them. And you, you know, so you'd find the, you know, p the folks in the fam Department of Family and Children's Services say, yeah, but they don't fit into like our foster care system because of these, it, they're, they're, they're promiscuous, for instance, or they're, they have all of these other um, concerns that make them not an ideal youth to place. And, and we only have so many specialized foster care placements available, and we want to reserve those for those that have, you know, major um, psychological issues or health issues. And so it just was, it was interesting to see how they, they, they didn't ping pong these youth around, but they really came in and it's like, oh, we're not sure how to deal with them in, with what our agency does. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's, you know, those are kind of, you know, just some examples. And the police I probably saw take the biggest 365 degree view of these youth from, you know, having them arrested and, and charged as prostitutes to really having a mind change among the police that these youth are really victims and they're not old enough to consent and so we need to do something different with them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a, quite, a, quite an interesting time. I, I find it very interesting that you talked about the, the term that used to be used was um, Child, child prostitutes. Mm -hmm. it, um, the, it seems that the, the language that's being used is very important yes. in the message that it conveys. Can you talk about that mm -hmm. um, a little bit and what, what language you, you feel most comfortable with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, the whole term like child prostitute, when we think of prostitution, even it's a criminal activity for adults to engage in. And obviously we have the pimping and the pandering of the the Johns and the pimps that um, are the customers and the sellers of sex, but but adult women would be charged with prostitution, um, and so to add, to simply add child in front of prostitute creates an impression that the child is a willing uh, participant in this sale of sex for money, and so it's important, and I know it's debated uh, even within the feminist community to agree to which adult prostitution is actually a. Um, should be criminalized, and the woman um, who's involved in the sale of sex, um, whether or not it's, it's 
best to view her as a perpetrator or as a victim. Um, but leaving that argument aside, that, and it might be very well be a very different argument for adults who are able to exercise some sort of informed decision. For children, it's, it's totally inappropriate. <laughs> and so, um, but the terms tend to linger in, in research literature, and they linger, they're slow to change. <laughs> Uh, so what we ended up moving away from, and, and it's kind of this transition, is, um, is to call it commercial sexual exploitation of children, which adding the commercial element means that there is some sort of commerce, some sort of um, something of value that's traded or received in response to that sale of that child for sexual purposes. Um, but, it, but it takes away the impression that the child is complicit in that or a willing participant in that. Um, and more recently, because of the, I think this is the global awareness of trafficking overall, and the fact that when we look at trafficking and the victims, we find that women and children are, pri are predominantly the group that experience that because of their social and economic disadvantages in, in communities, including our own, that they're more likely to be the ones that experience that. And so child trafficking has a piece of it which we, we refer to as sex, as, well, sex trafficking, trafficking children for sex. And um, so we call, and, and our focus has been largely within trafficking to look at, at sex trafficking. And that, that's true at both the, the, when we look at children who experience that or adults. Um, and it is considered a severe form. Um, our federal law states that as well as um, United Nations protocols. Um, differentiate the trafficking of children from adults for that reason and the penalties that are involved with um, participation in that um, being a trafficker of, of children are, might, are significantly higher. So I think um, there's a benefit to, to in many ways to um, linking this idea of you know sale of a child for multiple purposes um, whether it's to exploit their labor whether it's to um, in some ways there's some instances where children, um, where organs of children have been harvested for sale. Um, so, so to understand that sex is simply a commodity that this, and this children is seen as a, 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 a being that possesses that commodity that I can then sell. Um, so linking it with them is a good idea, I think overall, but I do think that there are unique um, experiences because of the nature of sexual assault that occurs in the process of sex trafficking that warrants us, um, you know, it, it warrants a different remedy from labor and, and other types of trafficking. Uh, were you aware, or were you actively involved in the, um, the issue outside of GSU, or was it, was it? Um, it was mainly through, through, mainly through Georgia State. Uh, I ended up getting involved with, or becoming more knowledgeable about what was going on in Atlanta and really with the runaway and the homeless population through um, kind of this, getting involved in this issue okay. and the links between those things. Uh, were you aware of what was going on with the, I, I assume you were with the Mayor's Dear John program? Yes. What did you think of that? That was a piece of... Yeah, the, the original funding that came from the, was from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention to the City of Atlanta. One of the key pieces was to raise community awareness. And one of the uh, tools used to raise that was the Dear John campaign that the, the mayor had put out. Um, and also some other public service announcements that were very powerful. Um, I didn't really see them all that much when they were unfolding. It was, I think, Atlanta um, Women's Foundation partnered with um, a, a Atlanta Film, Women's Film, Women in Film, a small uh, local group to actually um, go ahead and tape those and, and put those out. And I'm not sure if they targeted um, the actual announcements in certain communities versus others. I do remember seeing a few billboards. Um, but it, um, yeah, they were very powerful messages, and I thought courageous messages for, for the individuals that were involved. To do. Did you get the sense that there was a, a strong uh, public support for the work that was starting to, to sort of be done? Yeah, I think there was. I think um, probably among 
some communities more than others. Um, and part of the way that the, um, the initiative and the, the way to address it unfolded was it was kind of born out of this juvenile court setting. And as a result, um, much of what was focused on in the Save Atlanta and Fulton County was street prostitution, which at the time was the way that sex was sold. It was sold on the street. Um, obviously now, <laughs> with the onset of the internet and all other types of media devices and ways of communicating, um, it really has disappeared from public eye for the most part. Um, and you may still see tracks where there will be prostitutes and youth prostitutes, but overall, it's become a, a, you know, a meat that's been, that is um, um, you know, coordinated via cell phone and internet. And then many of the young women are in homes and houses in apartments and hotels. And so there's, you know, there's, they either go to where the John is or the, um, the uh, probably should use a stronger language there too, because that term is falling out of favor, but the person who's purchasing the sex or um, the purchaser will come and meet the girl. Um, but it's, uh, so, so the initiative started as, um, as really being seen as street prostitution because trafficking involves other things. So it involves, when we look at our federal trafficking law, it involves pornography. And it involves new dancing. I mean, it involves a range of other things, but, but the focus primarily in the city of Atlanta was addressing this issue of street prostitution. And when we look at the juvenile court and the population that comes in there, I mean, where it's predominantly a poor, it's predominantly minority, and it was predominantly, I think, because of the focus of the judge and the youth that were coming into her court, she had a lens on looking at it among young girls. Um, where the lens wasn't shining was how many young boys had, in, had to engage in sex for shelter or in exchange for something um, that might also, which is also exploitation, um, but were not really being kind of captured or um, their needs were not necessarily part of the initial focus that the city had. Um, and so I think uh, that, that um, there was a real galvanization around addressing the needs of that population, which was a very homegrown population. Um, and there wasn't a lot of attention to um, individuals that may be experiencing sexual exploitation and were underage but didn't fit in that realm. So inter any international victims, immigrant victims, um, and boys were, were largely not within the defining um, population that they were interested in serving. I think it, that's um, something that I've experienced talking to people who really don't know an awful lot about mm -hmm. um, child sex trafficking, is you, they hear the word trafficking and they always imagine it's something that's going on in um, Eastern Europe right. or in Thailand right. or in countries outside of mm -hmm. where we are mm -hmm. and they're often very shocked that, that um, this is actually going on right. extensively right. under our own noses. Well and they also always think of trafficking as movement from one place to another and that that has to be a piece of it and legally it doesn't. So the way the law is written you know you don't have to be moved from a single spot to be trafficked and er, even in our early interviews with police, when we were engaged in the research, they were defining it as that it has to be trans, you know, there has to be some kind of transportation, a victim from point A to point B. And it was like, no, <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be that. Um, so the common conception, I guess, probably because they think of drug trafficking, right, a product is transported, um, that it's the same thing applies to when you're talking about transportation or trafficking of human beings, but it really is not that. Yeah. So let's talk about the, um, the work that you did on, it, it was called the Evaluation of the Demonstration Project to Address Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children in Atlanta, Fulton County. Yeah. Um, and you worked on that between 2006 and 2009? Yes. Okay. Yes. Can you talk, talk me through the steps of you actually either choosing to be involved in this or being mm -hmm. chosen to be involved in mm -hmm. this? Sure. Um, well, as I say, that the there was a request for proposals, and we call RFPs in research lingo, 
that came out of the National Institute of Justice to do an evaluation. They wanted a process evaluation, so they wanted to understand how um, the initiative to respond to exploitation of children in the city of Atlanta unfolded. And they also wanted an estimate of the nature and extent of known cases within the city of Atlanta and Polk County. Um, so that RFP came out and um, it had, um, we, or I noticed it and, you know, and said naively, well, oh, evaluation, I can do evaluation. And, um, and plus I had, um, I had, I have a, I, in my work as an evaluator, I have, a, I've always brought a perspective of being a collaborative evaluation. So a collaborative evaluation is about partnering. And it's really about trying to draw, to um, begin um, working with agencies who want to understand what impact they're having, how effective they are at accomplishing their goals and objectives, by partnering with them and bringing them to the table, so that doing and doing assessment and um, kind of that self-reflection as an organization becomes a part of who they are, and that they don't have to have outside evaluators come in, but that they can actually sustain this on their own. And so I took that approach to this, and I thought that given the way the RFP was worded, that that's just really what they were looking for. This was a collaboration of, of agencies in the community. What better strategy than to bring a collaborative evaluation to the project? And so I saw the RFP and said, okay, well, I'm going to attempt to do this. And then I just began, a, um, so the so evaluation lays out the parameters, what they want done. And then you craft a proposal in response to the to what they want done, and um, you they give you an estimated budget. This they were only going to fund one evaluator, so I knew that you know, and I kind of saw that's easier than when they're going to fund multiple ones. And so they had a set dollar amount. Um, I think it was five hundred thousand okay. that they were willing to fund, and I knew it had to be a multi-year project because of the nature of the of what they wanted done. And so we had set up something to be a, I think it was a three-year project, and um, kind of crafted it. I mean, I brought together a team of faculty from the university, but I brought them in. They, I would, I would say they weren't formative in how I set up the evaluation or the design or the methodology. Uh, I kind of, I rather consulted with them after the fact. So I wanted to bring in someone from social work. Um, someone from um, psychology, from particularly clinical psychologists, given the nature of the population we were studying. I brought in a junior colleague from my own department as a means to try to mentor her in grantsmanship and, and um, to give her the opportunity to have some additional data on which to publish and to learn. And she had an interest in, in this area as well. Um, and then myself, so that, that was kind of the team. And we had not worked as a team before. And so those were, there were some bumps in the road there as well. Uh, but so I put the proposal together, submitted it, and then the National Institute of Justice has an evaluation process where they bring in um, like scholars like myself as well as practitioners from the community, uh, particularly in the area that's being examined, and they evaluate and rate and then make an award. Um, and so we received the award. And um, so my approach was, as I said, to kind of approach it as an, it should be an empowerment evaluation. And um, I gathered as much information with, as was available, and there wasn't much, really through um, a lot of internet searching, calling individuals, identified the Juvenile Justice Fund as one of the primary agencies that was involved and had been the individuals that received the initial funding from the U.S. government to start the collaborative. Um, and began just kind of piecing stuff together. So I think I put the proposal together probably in two and a half weeks, I would say. Yeah, it was fast um, and I was working very hard and, and when I submitted it, I thought there's absolutely no way that this is that we'll get this because there's so much I didn't know. Um, I had the original, um, I had some pieces of what the Juvenile Justice Fund had proposed and I was carousing their website. I was talking with Kathy McCullough at the time um, and she was new. Um, so everyone at the Juvenile Justice Fund that had been involved in the initial funding was gone. So there was not a lot of institutional history anywhere. 
Um, so I began to just try to piece together as much as I could about what I thought was going on and then, you know, laid out how we would go about doing it. And then they selected us. And then I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> now you have to do it. <laughs> what have I gotten into? <laughs> and can I do this? And, uh, and I, it was very exciting, um, actually, when I think back on it. Overall, I learned a lot. And it was an exciting project to be involved with. And um, I think I went into it rather naively um, with regard to just how political the environment was around the issue. And uh, I knew the agencies that there would be some tension and um, just, you know, because they each have turf and they're, you know, all that. Um, but, you know, that you, whenever you're going to do this kind of um, evaluation work and you have multiple partners at the table, um, you have to be able to navigate some troubled waters at times. And, um, I had done a little bit in the past, probably with four agencies, but never anything with 30. And so um, it was a challenge. Was were, a challenge. There, were there any agencies who really just stepped up and they were they were wonderful, embraced the whole thing? I think, um, I would say that we didn't, we did not get obstinance at any point. We never had anyone who said, we will not talk to you. Um, we did have people who said, I can't share with you because especially where we had the most difficult time was getting information about the nature and the extent of youth that these agencies were dealing with that were either at risk or had experienced commercial sexual exploitation. Then at times we had them say, well, even though we had a confidentiality, we had a privacy certificate for our research, which the National Institute of Justice requires. And that, what that does, it's even stronger than a confidentiality agreement in the sense that we could not be subpoenaed in court to talk about any aspect of what we were learning, cases, data, or anything like that. Um, and we would try to explain this to the agencies that, you know, there's not a chance that you would reveal something to us that we would then have to testify about. We, we have this blanket protection. And they still were reluctant. Um, even reluctant just to share with us the aggregate numbers, which is all we really wanted. We just simply wanted to know, give me a guess. Mm -hmm. How many kids this past week? If you don't think about it that way, how about today? How about in a month? <laughs> a year? I mean, somehow? Um, so, so, but, so we did not have any agency that was, re that was recalcitrant and said, we won't talk to you. We did have some that were reluctant. Um, and we off, we and, and I understood it. I mean, we are outsiders, and as much as Georgia State University, and I hope myself as a as an evaluator, I have a reputation for being fair and, um, um, you know, that I'm trustworthy, um, and sensitive to, to the other um, issues that the agency has around them. Um, I think they they were. Um, they were overall as participatory as they could be, given our role as an outside evaluator and the fact that they still were working out how those 30 agencies were going to get along at the table at, in addressing the problem anyway. Um, I will say the Juvenile Justice Fund and Kathy McCullough was a tremendous partner in this. And um, you know that organization and their willingness to kind of um, kind of vouch for us and give us entree into this group of community organizations, and I tr involved Kathy Kathy in um, kind of shared with her our proposal. Here's what we're looking for. Here's what we're hoping to collect. Um, she opened up her data as an as an organization so that I could document the history um, as well. So, I mean, by far, you know, that was the, the agency that just kind of said, okay, open book. Um, and I don't think we would have been able to do nearly, I mean, I didn't accomplish as much as I wanted with the project, but I don't think we would have gotten anywhere without she and I kind of just, and I think I helped, I like to think, and she's told me, I was helpful to her too, in the sense that I could bring my knowledge about evaluation, my knowledge about the issue and what was going on in other jurisdictions um, 
to help her think through some things as well because she was just starting as a kind of the coordinator of this then she ended up being um, stepped in temporarily to actually direct the juvenile justice fund for a period of time while she was still managing this project and other projects and so I think we we kind of struggled through uh, we both had a trial point in, in in both of our roles in the project and we tried to move forward as, as best we could and a lot of it had to do with the context of the lack and this is hard to imagine now and here in, in 2012 with the Georgia Care Connection okay. and the network of support and the level of awareness and um, that's happened. But at that time, particularly, um, we didn't have any kind of referral network. We had Angela's House, which was a longer term residential treatment place, but we didn't have an emergency shelter for youth that were unaccompanied by a parent or guardian. So the only place to put youth was at the Division for Youth Facility. And so we're brainstorming about how can we get DFACs involved in some way that would give us another avenue through the social service network that's out there. And they were operating under the Kenny, um, Kenny, um, Kenny A consent decree about the number of placements that they could make before permanent placement. So they didn't want us to bring anyone to them in an emergency capacity that they'd have to place temporarily and then try to, you know, it just was, there just was no, <laughs> there was no kind of easy way um, to unfold this. And so the issues that I was dealing with as a, as a researcher, trying to make certain that I had a place for youth to be safely if they wanted, were the same issues that she was dealing with as the agency that was kind of leading this initiative because we don't have that safety net and I don't have a safety net, so what do we do? This must be interesting for you or, or difficult for you because of the newness of the awareness of this issue. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, still is a very young yes. um, movement yes. to try and to stop sex trafficking. Yes. You, I don't know of any other issue recently that we were going, everyone was kind of going in blind and, right. and there was just no, was nothing in place for it. No. And so to try no. and figure that out at, well, at that time. Right. It, yes, at the time <laughs> that you're trying, yes. And, and realizing that there is no one entry point and that it's not like a youth comes to you and says, oh yes, and by the way, I've been sleeping with people and my boyfriend is taking the money and I don't want to do it, you know, they don't, it doesn't get disclosed like that. Um, so there's, a, there's just so many nuances to even trying to identify the population and how you do that and where are they and, um, you know, at what point do you begin to try to move them uh, on the path of change to where they want to make a change and no longer have to do that. And, uh, yeah, so there were all those things that were going on. It was pretty, pretty crazy, which I didn't know going into it, just how, because I thought, well, here's this network, this coordinated community response. It must just be working like, and it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't at that time. Well, one of the other things that you, you did as part of this study was to try and talk to yes. the young people. Can you talk about the efforts that you made to do that and oh, yeah. the challenges? And, and maybe yes. include <laughs> in that like your issues with IRB. I mean, yes. as an academic institution, we have right. to we have all of that. Yes. So one of the pieces of the project was um, well, we knew that we always wanted to interview some of the youth who had some touch point with the community coordinated response. So whether it was through the juvenile justice fund, through Angela's house. Um, you know this. Um, you know how much were the how you know kind of what were the use experiences? So we knew that we wanted to interview some who had been identified and received treatment, quote unquote, some sort of intervention. Um, so we had to create an IRB protocol um, to assure that we would protect those human subjects and that through their participation with us that they would not be harmed in any way. 
Um, and so we have that piece of it. And then the other piece of it was that part of the funding that the federal government gave us was that they wanted to get a sense of how many youth in the city of Atlanta and Fulton County um, had experienced or were experiencing this form of exploitation and victimization. And so we uh, took, we kind of brainstormed around what are the strategies that have been used in other cities. And what we found was, um, you know, so, so without looking at kind of what's in place in Atlanta, what's been done elsewhere. And so there were some studies that had uh, been successful in looking at and accessing youth who were on the street, so the runaway and homeless youth population, who had, particularly in Chicago and New York, had major um, initiatives in their cities to try to provide shelter and safety for this group. Uh, so we thought, well, there's a potential access point. Um, other access points might be through um, working with the Division for Youth Facilities because, again, if youth are coming through the juvenile court and they have their own screening process, we, we could access them there. But we could also, just among the general population, maybe they weren't flagged at the court level. Um, but in conversation with them through the Division for Youth, we might be able to see if in their history you know, maybe in this most recent contact with the court, it wasn't an issue, but maybe a year ago it was. So maybe we could get access there. Um, and so we crafted protocol to try to gain access. Uh, but we also, um, one of the issues in, if a youth is already in a safe setting, so there's an adult, or there's some agency that's taken on the responsibility of caring for that youth, then the IRB protocol is not all that difficult because you have resources that are available and they are in a safe place, they're not on the street. So doing this stuff with the Division for Youth facility wasn't difficult, nor was it if working through um, Department of Family and Children's Services if we wanted to do um, that route. Um, the problem came when we wanted to actually try to do some street level research. And um, we had put together a protocol and I guess in understanding kind of the backgrounds of some of the youth, particularly those who have run away, they often run away from, for a reason. And sometimes that reason is that they're experiencing some form of abuse, physical, psychological, or sexual at home. And they don't really want their family um, to know where they are. They want to remain anonymous. They want to remain out there. And they've made that choice, and granted, they're a minor, so, you know, is it a... You know, is it a choice that's legal? Is it, you know, is it a mature decision? Well, maybe not. But as researchers, we were trying to kind of come from the perspective that we were going to respect the decisions that those youth had made and not question them. Um, however, <laughs> when you come across a youth who's an unaccompanied minor, so someone who's not emancipated, who, who doesn't have legal um, has not been given by the courts the uh, ability to operate as an adult, to engage in a contract, to rent an apartment, and those kinds of things. So they're not emancipated, and they're, so they are technically an unaccompanied minor who should really be um, in the care and custody of an adult, a, a legal authority that can make those decisions. So. <laughs> We tried to come up with a strategy whereby we could, um, our fear was that if we did what was probably ethically, um, from one perspective, the safest and perhaps best approach, it would be that should we come across a homeless youth or a runaway youth and should they be willing to talk to us and that we discover that they're 14, that we would call DFACS, Department of Family and Children's Services, and have them come and interview the youth and try to find out who their, where their home was, who their parents were, and to notify their parents about them. Um, and that would assure that the youth would no longer be kind of at risk in the larger community for all the risks of victimization and exploitation that they might experience. Um, and that was clearly what I think the IRB board wanted us to do. Um, but I explained to them that if we take that approach, 
that it's likely no youth will talk to us. And therefore, they'll continue to be out there and they'll continue to be anonymous, and we won't know anything more about their condition than we know today. And maybe that's what you would like us to do, but we think there's a value in knowing what that condition is like. And if we have to um, err on the side of a judgment about where that youth should be, we're going to err on the side of the judgment of the youth and try to be respectful of that. And um, I went through myriads of revisions to protocol and um, from the, the Institutional Review Board reviews what you're doing and they give you feedback and there's things that they wanted us to change and so I would bring back justification for why we couldn't do X, Y, or Z. And it went through all the things you would think. Well, isn't there a way to get them into shelter without notifying defects um, so that their parents are notified? Well, no, there isn't. Um, is there, so there are all these, these strategies they wanted, which we had walked and talked through ourselves. Um, but I knew that, I mean, it's a difficult thing, and I understood where my colleagues were coming from. Um, at the end, um, what I ended up doing was going in front of the IRB and talking with them about what we were doing and, you know, acknowledging the difficult kind of moral um, complexity of this area. And um, that we came up with a kind of a compromise position that we, while we wanted to be able to approach youth on the street, we would be willing to give them information and even a card that if they wanted to get off the street and wanted safety right that minute, that they, we would hand them a cell phone, they would call and an organization called Safe Place which was operating at that time out of DeKalb, was we had talked with them and they were willing to come and provide that. Now, Safe Place somehow operates without needing to involve defects. Uh, I don't know how they do that, but they do. And, and besides that, they had kind of the staff and the ability to really understand the nuanced situation that the youth was in and help the youth make a decision. We on the other hand, as researchers, we're not thinking in this course of this interview, there's no way that we would have the privacy, the space, and the length of time in contact with this youth to help them make a decision about their safety. So that was a strategy that we came up with, um, but I do remember in the course of the IRB, and it really just kind of cut my, almost cut my legs out under me when in person, one of my colleagues said, well, you are asking our institution at Georgia State to be just like the Catholic Church, to be aware that abuse is occurring but doing nothing about it. And I said, well, I think that's harsh. I said, and it's not, it's not as though in our interview with the youth we're asking anything about their abuser nor would we want to ask. We're not, we're not even kind of peeling back the nature of their abuse experience. We wanted to keep it at a level of, we simply wanted to know, you know, was really an interview about their, their runaway status and their homelessness status, of which one element asked them if they had ever had to engage in sex for money. And if, you know, and, and then if they said yes, then we asked questions about, you know, was this a one time, how long, um, was there someone that forced you to do this? But we never revisited any, we didn't ask them how many people, how many times, we simply wanted to know. And, and along with other experiences that, you know, victimizations they might have had. Um, as well as what they really, what we wanted to find out is how did they, managed to navigate all of that. So to keep it focused on recognizing their resiliency rather than get into a therapeutic transformation of them from survivor to victim, we didn't want to do that. So we tried to frame the interview as a way of you know, what are the kinds of negative and positive experiences that you've had. And oftentimes their positive experiences of the few interviews that we were able to do with runaway youth were kind of about the sense of control that they felt they had in their life, the independence that they had, 
how they were able to successfully leave that situation that, w that was unbearable to them and get to another one that wasn't great, but was better in their eyes. Um, so we, you know, the IRB was, was, was really difficult. Um, I think we came up with something that worked. And then as we tried to roll it out, because we had had conversations with DFACs earlier on about what can we do about, um, if a youth does want help, what can we do? And we also ended up talking with um, um, the way our laws are written, the domestic and the international protections for victims based upon their international status or domestic status, there's different resources that are available. And then for an international victim, there's far more that kicks in than for a domestic victim. And so we talked with some of the um, folks that were involved with providing um, services, or rescue services for international victims, hoping that we could learn from them and, um, <laughs> you know, maybe uh, tap into some of their resources. And we weren't productive in doing that. But um, yeah, so getting at that population was difficult. We ended up, um, we did a couple of things. We we partnered with Covenant House, which is a um, um, nonprofit. I believe it's Christian based but I'm not sure if it's affiliated with any particular denomination. Um, and they provide services to uh, mainly young, I would say young adults, but these are youth that are 16 to 24 year old who um, are also going through some major um, difficulties in their lives and are long, no longer living at home. Um, and they, uh, we had reached out to them very early on because they do street ministry. And so they are driving around in vans and they're hitting the Greyhound bus station where a lot of the pimps go to try to recruit right off the buses, the MARTA stations, the malls. And so we thought we could partner with them and while they were providing their services to the older youth that we could, my hunch was that there's protection in numbers and that um, some of our youth might actually be hanging out with some of these older individuals or it's potentially that some of these older individuals were actually exploiting some of our younger kids. Uh, but yeah, so um, so we tried that route and that didn't work well. Um, well, it, um, we had an, an individual from the agency uh, who uh, we went out in the van with him one night and he was a little reckless. Um, and, and granted, it, for him and his safety and his comfort level, he was, it was fine for, for what he did. But I had students, graduate students, I had trained as interviewers and myself, and I wasn't quite willing to take the risks that he was and to, to, you know, he drove into this alley way with his van and gets out and starts kind of, you know, just being very, um, I wouldn't say aggressive, but verbally, you know, um, kind of confronting some of the youth that were in the alley. And I just thought, you know, this isn't going to end well. And, um, you know, we're all sitting in the van going, what is he doing and why is he doing that? <laughs> and so my, some of my interviews said, we're not really comfortable partnering with him. And I said, that's fine. And we did it. So I rode along for a couple of weeks and just realized we weren't going to reach the same populations. He was, he was definitely um, really working with older kids than, than we needed. But we did, we did ask Covenant House if they came across any youth, please feel free. By that time we had, we had had cards made up. We would love to talk with them if any of them are aware of where younger kids are. Because again, we were trying to um, look at those 17 or under 17, so 16 and younger. Um, so we also, uh, in part of our, um, try, still trying to do the street outreach piece of it, um, contacted Stand Up For Kids, which is an all-volunteer organization. It has a branch here in Atlanta, and there's several throughout major cities in the U.S. And what they offer was kind of a drop-in place for youth to go. Um, they were open two nights a week, and they're located near Grady. Now, they can't provide, and I think the law has changed in the last year about providing shelter for youth who are unaccompanied. Um, but when we were working, no organization could provide shelter, short-term or long-term, without notifying the Department of Family and Children's Services. Right? So the Stand Up for Kids, they, it was a drop-in place, 
but no one slept there. So they could come in if they needed some place to be safe, if they needed some food, they wanted to take a shower, they wanted to just chill for a couple of hours, and then they were put back out at the end in, in the evening. Yeah, so not ideal. Um, but so that, uh, and we partnered with them, we put flyers up and um, we asked them if they wouldn't mind, um, you know, if we had initially had asked, can we come and just hang out? And they said no, that they really wanted to be this safe haven for kids and they didn't want a lot of asking of questions. I mean, not that we would have done that, but I can understand where they were coming from. They wanted to make sure it was a safe place for the kids to have some respite. Mm -hmm. um, and so we tried that avenue. And then uh, we, in working with uh, kind of the, there was a coalition of agencies that were coming together around runaway and homeless youth, and they were planning this huge kind of community fair, resource fair. Covenant House was involved, Stand Up for Kids was involved, a couple of other organizations. Um, and they never seemed to be able to pull it off. So they planned it for one month. It was gonna be out at Covenant House, which is near to College Park and then it got canceled. So we thought all we would do is set up a booth there and we could maybe recruit kids through that process. Got canceled one month, got canceled the next month. Finally, we said, we'll just host it at Georgia State. <laughs> so we hosted a youth resource fair and we had, I think, 25 or 30 homeless youth come. Um, for our age group, as I said, we were 16 and under, we only had 15 that we interviewed. Of those 15 we interviewed, um, there were two that had noted that they had engaged in, you know, ex exchange of sex for money or shelter, and only one that was what we would have called pimp controlled. Um, and so we learned what we could from them, but it wasn't the big because it was in Georgia State, yeah. and despite we blanketed you know, MARTAs and we talked with the agencies that were going to be there at the booths, let your, you know, let your constituents know, please let your partner agencies know. We didn't get a large turnout. I had so much pizza left over, I could have uh, fed uh, probably everybody in the, um, down at the adult men's shelter from all the pizza we ordered from, uh, really good pizza too. Uh, but anyway, um, so we tried that venue, we tried to identify them that way. Um, and so we were kind of, I mean, the, probably the overlying, we also got data on uh, the number of cases of what well, at that time would have been child prostitution or victimization, sexual victimization of youth from the city of Atlanta Police Department. And that was probably a very rich data source for us. Um, though of the you know, 1,100 victimizations, um, fewer than 5% were of youth. Um, uh, and that involves sexual victimization of youth. Um, so not a large number of known cases over, and that was over a four year period. We have like 2003 to 2007. Um, the other place we looked for data and we thought it would just be a rich source. And again, kind of looking at what the collaborative had tried to accomplish was that they had set up this database called the Cactus Database, which was a child abuse case tracking information system. And it wasn't designed specifically for the purposes of, of exploitation of children, or sexual exploitation of children, but it was really a child abuse database. And so we were told that this was widespread. Agencies were using it across Atlanta, the city of Atlanta and Fulton County, as well as their nonprofit partners and that all organizations had been trained on it and they gave you know several thousand people trained and that they were encouraged and told to put their data into the centralized database because if a youth comes into school and you you in the and expresses that they've experienced this this day if they had contact with any of the other agencies you would know about it through this database um, and so we thought, here's this rich database on, on trafficking um, and exploitation, this kind of commercial form. And then when we got the database, access to the database through the Juvenile Justice Fund, there was so much missing data and there was not a data element that, f that flagged this particular type of abuse victim. So we had to go through and read narrative mm -hmm. to try to find and they kept telling us, there's a flag for that, there's a flag, for, there's a variable for that. And we said, no, there's not. Um, so, and they not only had information, supposedly information on the victims, but it also had information on who the perpetrators were, 
<clears throat> and um, you know what was happening in their case because the prosecutor's offices were also involved and they were one of the partners. So it was meant to be this rich database. What we found from that database was about 50 youth, and it had been the, the database had maybe I want to say nine. 900 cases in it at the time. Um, 50 of them we determined were either at risk or had experienced um, commercial sexual exploitation. And when we broke down the numbers, about 15 were what we would call known victims, and 35 were those that were, that were at risk. Um, but there was so much, m so many missing data elements that we really couldn't get much beyond the age of the youth was in there pretty regularly. Um, but not a lot besides that. Their race, but we didn't have some of the details that we had thought, like who, who was the person that was exploiting them. And um, so, so we tried all these <laughs> different places. Um, it was really, we, I mean, the team was just like, where could it be, where could it be, where do we find this information? And then we tried the agency interviews, where we just would go, well, these are the agencies that are in the front line dealing with kids Let's find out how many of them cross their path. And we often, a couple of times, people didn't know what we were talking about. And I said, with all this attention and all this training and awareness, you don't know. And uh, it, was, uh, it was quite disappointing. Yeah. It was looking for the needle in the haystack. And um, you have to understand our frustration was that you know, this is an epidemic in this city, right? That was what the media was telling us. And even the FBI, you know, one of the top 15 cities. How can you not know, right? How can this not be something you're, you know, that you're noting somewhere? And some organizations, to their, to their credit, like the court said, you know, if we have the youth come in <clears throat> and we suspect this, we're going to charge them with something else. We're not going to charge them with prostitution. It, because by charging them, we know that we can at least temporarily get them out of the control of this pimp and get them into the Division for Youth, which is not the ideal setting, but it's least secure and gives the youth a time away from that abusive relationship to maybe get their head in a different place. And so we don't want that label on them. We're going to hold them for something else. Well, that obviously you know, makes it your numbers when you're looking go like this looks like it's really declined. But the reality is you're just not calling it what you were calling it before. Jeez. And um yeah, so it was That's it was such a challenge. It was amazingly difficult. And meanwhile in our partner organization in New York, the city has this intensive kind of network of support for runaway youth. Be, you know, it's New York, mm -hmm. so it's every kid that runs away, that's eventually where they want to go, if not there, Los Angeles. And so they rolled out a very similar strategy. We actually modeled our um, sampling strategy on what they were doing. And we couldn't even identify seeds in the community to refer, to make referrals for us. Yeah. Um, and again, we had this difficulty of, um, the laws are very different from New York and Georgia. And so the kind of the hurdles we had about how do we get access to this youth without then perhaps um, having them placed in a more vulnerable situation if they have to return home to an abusive situation. New York didn't have to deal with that because they have the children in need of supervision's um, method by which they can kind of leave the family, if it's not a safe home environment, out of it and try to address the youth needs through a different pathway. And for us, that just wasn't an option. I think it's um, often very surprising for people um, when they think about uh, child sex trafficking and how awful it is. The very notion that some of these kids choose that because yes. it's so much worse in mm -hmm. that the home that they've been either brought up in or yes. have been living in. I think that that's a very difficult thing for it is. Um, people to emotionally yes. understand. Yes. Because it, it must have been awful yes. for, for them yeah. to then choose that kind of lifestyle. Yeah. Well, I think it, the way I try to have tried to understand it is that in a home context, you have the abuse with none of the independence. 
and yeah. none of the while it's not real the level of affection that a pimp will show that to me is what's sad um, but when so when that person leaves that environment and they have that affection even though they have perhaps are required to do far more sexually with people and things that they wouldn't necessarily have done in the home environment it feels like it's a better place because that that emotional attachment is there um, and they have an independence that they didn't have at home so you know there and, and I think that's hard for people to understand too is that, well if they can kind of be out there and strutting their stuff why can't they just strut and walk away and it's like oh no 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 because remember what they came from you know it's not as though they walked out of an environment where they felt that um, they really had nothing and didn't matter to suddenly becoming now that they're free from that this fully developed rational mature empowered person they're not they're incredibly more vulnerable right because they don't have the structure or the security of home at all and they put their care really their their life in the hands of this other person why would they walk away from that who could walk away from that and to what else what it's someone else who's going to offer them something better what would that look like? It's very difficult to educate people to actually understand that, to understand that you know, mm -hmm. when you've come from a, a stable, right. um, simple mm -hmm. background yourself, to, right. to understand that you have young people who have, have had no choices, have, right. have been abused, have been, it, it's the, the level of abuse or mm -hmm. um, uh, isolation mm -hmm. or and just, just neglect yeah I, think. Just, um, I always think of my own children and, and part of what I what I see around me is, is kind of, it's an, it, it, it can I don't mean it to be a class difference but I think it is a difference between a healthy environment and an unhealthy one is that in healthy environments children in the home can be the center of life right in unhealthy environments they are forgotten they are like a piece of furniture and they know that they don't matter and life happens to them and they have no power in shaping it at all and that I think is one of the key differences it helps me understand why they want to leave to matter somewhere even if at times that's a painful experience they feel like they matter in a way that they never did in that home environment and um, that is a powerful thing. That is a powerful need we have as human beings. And I think that it's sad that that, that, that is enough, right? Well, and, and, and how much negative conditioning over many years has mm -hmm. had to take place. It's, it's, it's in some ways similar to women who stay with abusive yes. partners. Yep. Um, there's there's this, this conditioning mm -hmm. that... that it's very difficult to understand mm -hmm. as an it, outsider. Yeah. Um, you know, why can't you just walk away from it? Right. It, right. It, it's just, it, unless you walk in someone's shoes, I think it's yeah. very, very difficult. I had a, one of the young people I worked with when I worked in childcare. Um, these were boys that had been, um, some of them had been neglected and abused, and some had moved into delinquency. But I had one of them tell me one day if I was telling, he goes, I just feel like the world was made for everyone else, and I am just a guest. And I thought, wow, that is amazingly powerful. That he just was going through life as though he didn't belong there. And this world and everything that happened in it was for everyone else. And he tried to go under the radar throughout his, and he was, he was 11 years old. And he had this perception. And I just thought, no, it, it can be better. It is for you. Yeah. And don't allow anyone to tell you it's not. I mean, it's, but that's the kind of life condition that he had gone through with in his brothers. I mean, it was just, it was a very tragic case. That that one was a tough one. Now, when you did um, get to talk to mm -hmm. young people, yeah. um, it was you and some graduate assistants who did the interviews. Yes. How yeah. how did they um, respond to to you? Um, well, we did it in an environment that was, um, I, 
think a fairly safe one. Um, we didn't bring them into any kind of office and close the door or whatever. We found some place outside that was um, that was not a lot of traffic, foot traffic and the like. Um, and again, in the context of talking about um, the um, you know their experiences on the street and what they had gone through. I mean, some of their some of the worst there were probably worse things that happened to them, victimization wise. Um, than what happened in the course of uh, our asking about this um, issue of selling, you know, selling their bodies for money. And, you know, some of them had, you know, some a couple of the kids, we, um, they were already parents. You know, we had a 16-year-old a girl who had a child, and we had a couple, two boys that had children. We had a married couple, you know, a couple that had, you know, he was older and she was 16, I think. And they were married and lived on the street, and they had their daughter. I mean, it was just, yeah, I mean, the population, we think of the homeless population as these kind of older old men, right, who've got mental illness or mm -hmm. um, issues with um, um, prior military experience and post-traumatic stress and all that. But this was a different side uh, of, uh, to see. Um, but their experiences, I mean, some of the, we also, in addition to wanting to know about kind of what, you know, what was the context in which they ended up on the street and how they found themselves in this position. It was a transitory one for some of them. It wasn't, you know, again, the one case we had, the young woman who was in the pimp control thing, um, pimp control process, um, exploitation, she ended up um, eventually just kind of getting involved, getting a job, and then working her way away from him. And she was all 16 years old. Right, so she had, this was something she experienced when she was 13, 13 and 14, and then the minute she could get working papers and kind of get into, into something, she took a pathway out and she got out, which was amazing. Now, was her life great? Was she living the high life? No, she was struggling. Um, you know, their housing was an issue. I mean, all the things that, that you can imagine. Um, but we also wanted to know about, in particular this came to light when we interviewed, we did a focus group at Angela's House, which was the center for care of the young women that had been exploited. And we talked with them about their experiences, not just with this life that they led, um, or were trying to transition out of, but their contact with law enforcement and the system. And I mean, um, the, the few that we interviewed didn't have great things to say about many of the members of our law enforcement community for how they were treated and how they were talked to and the perception that police officers have of them is, um, and again, this is just a, a being a runaway youth, not even the add on to that, that they might be involved in sex for money, um, that they were just not very compassionate or caring. And oftentimes if they wanted help, the police would be like, didn't want to bother, you know, and I, from teaching in, in the criminal justice area, when I hear some of the officers in my class and they say, gosh, a juvenile, dealing with juvenile, that's 12 hours I'm spending my time and I'm not getting paid once my shift's done and I'm, pro it's just the apparatus, the hurdles that go in. Um, so I, you know, understand it from both sides. You understand why they feel like, you know, and, the, and it's not that I think they're misrepresenting um, the law enforcement's response is just we've done nothing on law enforcement side to make this an easy area to intervene in. Mm -hmm. um, even though we all kind of know the outcome we want, we put all these processes in place um, that make it more difficult for them um, to get there. But um, yeah, so the, I mean, the youth themselves, the few we were able to talk to, um, it, you know, it's difficult, it's a difficult um, and unpredictable and the levels of victimization and uncertainty and uh, fear. And I think it's the, the mindset of, of just kind of living hour to hour and day to day. And to have to do that at such a young age and navigate so many um, things because they don't have legitimacy to to get a lot of things or ask for a lot of things and how we perceive them in the community. Um, you know, groups of boys that we automatically think are gangs. 
Well, maybe they're not. Maybe they're together for safety reasons, right? Um, and how, how exhausting it must be to live that kind of lifestyle. Yes. And to know that you can't go to shelter, you know, which is what we provide for adults. I mean, it's a weird context that the most vulnerable are the ones that we provide the least to. I, I still can't understand that. I still, I mean, I know it's hard, and I know there's lots of questions, but really? Um, Did you, um, I want to talk about the, 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 the group of, of academics, obviously, who were um, working on this study. Were there any problems or surprises that came about through mm -hmm. the process based on the fact that you were coming from Multiple different disciplines? Yeah, disciplines? Yes. yeah, I think particularly, um, well, I originally wanted clinical psychologists involved because I was concerned, and again, going into it, thought there would be all these um, individuals who'd experienced these major traumas, and that I would need some, a team kind of there to be able to do some just immediate intervention. Um, and then we had refer, we had a count, we had a clinical psychologist that we could refer to here on campus. Um, but what I didn't realize was the, the ethical obligations of clinical folks. So that for instance, just as much as the IRB had difficulty with us, um, you know, interviewing someone who's 14 years old, spending an hour with them, and then walking away. So did my clinical psychologists, because their ethical obligation is to intervene and to refer, and that's part of their licensing. So they had a different set of obligations that conflicted with the obligations of being a researcher and, and um, assuring that that human subjects um, what that human subject wanted was what would happen rather than yeah. so that created some issues and what we ended up doing was the irony was the very reason I wanted them involved was to help with these interviews and they ended up not being able to do any of them so and that meant that myself and other members of the team mainly my my junior colleague had to be trained in how to do the interviews and what to look for and what, you know, we're both, you know, pretty attuned and, we were, you know, we astute people and I think, but I wasn't sure I was prepared to hear what was going to be told to me. Um, and so, and I didn't go into it thinking I would have to hear it because, you know, while I worked with youth early on in my career and I've heard stories from adult victims of intimate partner violence and even children who witnessed violence. I wasn't quite sure I was ready to hear about these kind, the nature of this type of victimization from the mouth of babes. Um, but we did, and we got trained, and we were, and it worked out okay. Um, and, and 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 there were other kind of other tensions around. I had um, most of my team were white okay. researchers, and my clinical psychologists and the two doctoral students were, were clinical psychologists, were African American. And I had a, gra a graduate research assistant from criminal justice who was African American, and I had another student who was a former law enforcement officer, a white male, right? So it was a, quite a mix of folks. And I realized early on that we all brought our own lenses into this. Um, and while the whole identification of who was the prototypical victim of commercial sexual exploitation in the city of Atlanta was the African American girl. Um, I walked into it with a skepticism as to whether or not that was really the true picture or if it was the picture, only picture that we were seeing because of how we were accessing and identifying them, which to me meant the importance of the integrity of um, trying to get that picture of the nature and the extent outside of what the community organizations were even telling us or referring to us, which they didn't do anyway. Um, but I really felt that that street level information was very important to get. And I wanted to get it. And when I want to get something, I'm <laughs> trying to figure out a way to get it. And that brushed against um, 
kind of what my some of my colleagues on the team felt um, and so I was challenging kind of the the picture and the political stance that had been taken and, and I understood it I understood and I do to this day understand that when there's an initiative that bubbles up that addresses probably one of the most disempowered groups in our communities young african-american women I am I understand the need to do that and working in an advocacy organization like the juvenile justice fund and working with the juvenile court especially around issues of girls I get it. It's rare that we focus attention on that population in a way. But as a researcher, I had to bring a different lens. And that lens was, okay, this population that's experienced this has been identified, but does that mean there's no one else in there? Does that mean there's no boys? Does that mean that there's no Latinos? Does that mean there's no Asians? Does, and does that mean that it's only from these communities? I mean. Atlanta's a big city. What's happening in more, more affluent parts of the city? Especially because the onset of the internet was yeah. happening. and um, So there were other ways to market besides the traditional street level market. And I wanted to look at pornography. And I wanted to look at the, and, but the minute I wanted to broaden the scope and shift it away, see I thought I was broadening the definition of the problem but, and didn't really think that not only am I, as I'm doing that, I'm shifting the attention away from this very needy and deserving population. And I didn't see it as an either or. I just saw it as bringing more to the table. But in hindsight now, recognizing how hard the women that were involved in this initiative from the beginning fought to get this on the table, to get it in the media, all the ads, all the resources, I understand now where they're coming from. I don't think I would have changed how I approach things, though. Um, but I would have managed it hopefully better among my team, because my team kind of got divided, and um, and it did, and it was difficult. It was difficult for us to work as a team. Um, we would come together, and there would be conflict. And what I ended up doing to resolve it was I recognized that our coming together as a team. It's interesting because we're studying collaboration, right? That we were unable to collaborate effectively. And so I said, we're just going to divide up these pieces and your team is going to do this piece and this team's going to do that piece and that team's going to do that piece and you will all submit it to me and I will make sense of it. But we're not going to try to bridge these disciplinary, cultural, racial divides anymore because we're, we're destroying each other. It's getting in the way. It's getting in the way. Um, and so I made that executive decision to do that. And I made a lot of executive decisions in that, which is not what I normally do. It's not how I normally work. But I couldn't handle the hurt that was happening among the team members. Um, and allegations were made about racism that weren't founded. Um, and it just, it really did not bode well and there's a there's a couple members of the team that I probably won't work with in the future um, because of just because of um, misunderstandings and whether you know my ultimately in the day my was my responsibility as the PI in the project um, and as much as I try to build equal power across not everyone who comes to the table wants that power and at the end of the day, when they want a head to put on the, on the you know, to post on the poll, it's going to be the PIs. And I take that. I accept that. Um, but we got to the point, fortunately, with NIJ, and because we were also trying to do stuff with New York. And so all of this tension is happening and unfolding around the same time. I'm pushing to replicate the New York model. New York models posing a threat to the powers that be on some on my team and some in the community because they they didn't want us to broaden our focus either um, so the members of the collaborative said we've defined this very nicely and neatly for us don't you try to broaden it right but and I said I'm not trying to broaden it for you to address but I have to look at it as what's the extent of this phenomenon and this phenomenon is beyond the people who your agency touch. There's others in the community who you're unaware of. I have a responsibility to try to identify who they are. 
And in the end, they got that, but I think they still felt threatened by that in some way. Isn't that um, really not surprising, again, considering how young know. a movement it was yes. and how it, I, we're still learning yes. the extent yes. and the complexity mm-hmm. of all of the parts yes. to it. Oh, it, it definitely. Know, it's like they hold on to what they... Right. And it's also that there's such turmoil. There was such change in the leadership. So the initial women that came together to kind of galvanize the community around this movement, suddenly they were dispersing and going into different areas of their lives. And so the, the initiative was feeling that the one piece that keeps us together here is this commitment to providing attention to this so underserved population. Yeah. And we need to keep that focus. Um, and again, and I understand that and I respect that, it's still that I felt I was brought in by the federal government to look at this in a different way, not necessarily whether it, how Atlanta wanted to define it is their business, right? But I'm looking at, okay, if we want to learn from this for other communities, how might we, from the very beginning, is it possible to define this more broadly? Um, or does it always have to kind of have this one one group that has ownership and um, and uh, control over the issue? Um, and I think it, since then, I mean, looking at where it is now, I think it's a much different movement. I think it's at a much different pl- a different place, and so there's growing pains with all of it. Um, I still am hoping that we can get a better sense of what it really looks like. Um, and you know, again, try to um, try to bring boys into this in a way that we haven't. Yeah. But we'll see. Um, before we go on to beyond the the um, uh, the project, were you surprised by any of the results that you found? Um, I was somewhat surprised at. Um, we were, again, trying to understand how the process unfolded and kind of what worked and what didn't work and if it didn't work, why didn't it work kind of thing to, to kind of lay out the blueprint for what we call it the black box. You know, what happens between an initiative as it's written and how it unfolds. And looking at the gaps between what the, what the Juvenile Justice Fund and the collaboration had wanted to accomplish and what it did and what parts were working well was that there was a tremendous effort at the time to put together this protocol under which all of these 30 community agencies would identify and respond so that, so that at, kind of as part of their normal intake process of dealing with youth, they would begin to have on their radar whether or not youth were experiencing this and what were the signs to look for and if they recognized it, what could they do and if they were an agency that provided direct services or had something that they could offer this population, what was it? And they put so much effort around that protocol. And it was going to become part of the child abuse protocol for the county. And it did. And, but they spent six months, nine months, trying to get signatures of all the heads of the agencies onto this protocol. And then they did, but there was no teeth behind it. It was entirely voluntary. And so the Juvenile Justice Fund, which is a wonderful organization, um, and was really an advocate for families and, and youth that came through the juvenile court, and they were the leading, you know, agency in this whole initiative. But they're a nonprofit outside of government, really no strong figure there that could comp- get these agencies to apply to anything, right? So. So at the end of the day, there was all this effort around this, what seemed to be this formal protocol that at the end just kind of seems as though it's, you know, I've heard it maybe it's going to be part of, it got incorporated into the standard protocol and they're going to revisit it and all that. But so there was this operational stuff going on at this upper level, this higher agency head level that everyone was focused on. But when we looked at the day-to-day, so these cases come in, someone, obviously a youth discloses, someone recognizes or observes and says something doesn't look right here, and they intervene. At that level, there was a group of people who were working with a child abuse investigation team that looks at all types of um, child abuse cases, particularly sexual and extreme forms of physical abuse, and they conference on it every week. And so that kind of collaboration that we wanted at this upper level 
they had working at the lower level. But it had been working long before the, the sexual exploitation of children thing came on the scene. Um, so that group was working well, respectful, energized, committed, um, and had, you know, as the prosecutors, schools, healthcare, um, defects, they were all together and all just working well. Um, and so that that kind of unfolded at operational level, but it was something that had already been in place and it had proved effective for them. And they were the people who knew and understood. And I felt as if the farther we got away from the, the kind of the boots on the ground people, the less anyone knew yes. and the less consistency and understanding there was about it. Um, so it, it did kind of surprise me that the efforts where the efforts were directed didn't necessarily yield this this big aha, but the stuff that had kind of bubbled up from the ground as just a functional way, how are we going to manage these abuse cases, and just kind of absorbed the CSEC problem into it rather seamlessly, right? But there weren't a lot of CSEC cases being identified by that group, but when they were, they were noticed and appropriate things brought in to deal with it. Um, so that was surprising. The politics of all of it was also surprising. Shouldn't have been because I had always, I'd been warned by my colleagues, don't ever do any work with Fulton County or City of Atlanta because the politics will kill you. Um, and I thought, oh yeah, I know, but I'm different. You know, we all think we're different. Um, but the, the amazing amount of, there was a real power vacuum when Nina Hickson um, stepped down from the bench. Um, and no one really stepped in. So, I mean, she was the driving force, the juvenile court judge recognizes an issue, gets the juvenile justice fund motivating, sets up CEASE, you know, CEASE, um, the juvenile fund gets money to build Angela's house, but all of it's really centered around the juvenile court, and then it's not. And so it's like, well, who's gonna step in? Well, will it be the prosecutor? You know, will it be Paul Howard? Will it be another juvenile court judge? Will it be the mayor? And they all kind of stepped in periodically when the initiative was losing momentum, you know, probably likely because of Kathy and the um, Deborah Richardson and, um, um, uh, oh gosh, the uh, councilwoman, blanking on her name now, Boxel, Nancy uh -huh. Boxel. Mm -hmm. You know, they would somehow nudge it back into under someone's, we need you to lead. I can hear the conversation in my mind a million times, we need you in front of this. But none of them really put it on as a coat and wore it. And so I worried that it might not be sustainable because the Juvenile Justice Fund is an organization without authority. Um, and it seemed to be, it had the most, it was making the most headway when it was someone in public office who, could, who had, would always command an audience, right? Mm -hmm. So with, with Hickson, it became a piece. Of she would, you know, she would talk about it. And she would bring it to the communities and and raise awareness that way. And then, like I said, the mayor did for a while. The prosecutor did for a while. There was another juvenile court judge, um, Sanford, who unfortunately was killed in a um, a plane at crash, um, who we thought was going to step in, and didn't. I mean, because of the, um, but it was very, very, very passionate about the issue. Yeah. So there was, but there was always some. So, so I worried about the sustainability of it. But um, then, kind of at the very end of our project, the Juvenile Justice Fund had gotten some funding from the Anderson, I think it was the Anderson Foundation, um, to kind of launch into um, some research to, to try to get an estimate, a sense of what the numbers were of, of youth who were victimized in this way. Um, also, were able to bring together. I think Street Grace started rolling out at that time. So they. So again, the Juvenile Justice Fund had done some partnerships with um, some of the faith community and got the faith community moving on it. And so Street Grace is up and operational. And then the uh, governor's office on families and children came and I think or you know, now there's a, I think there's a task force of some sort that they're operating and they got Georgia Care Connection, which is that one port of entry. So there's been so much that's happened and I think the governor's office kind of feeling, I had, you know, recognizes as a statewide issue, not a city of Atlanta, Fulton County issue, has made all the difference. 
um, and it brings the resources and it you know brings the weight of the um, the first lady is very involved in that particular office and her passion is around children and families so it, I think there's the potential for it now to to be sustainable um, I do think there's a lot of services and needs that the youth that we haven't even begun to recognize what they're going to need to to grow into mature adults and prosper I mean it's when I sit down, it almost seems like, how in the world can you, can we do that? Um, it's beyond, you know, specialized foster care, and it's beyond, I mean, it's beyond any of the needs that our foster care population has. Um, I think it's just, it almost is overwhelming it's to think, daunting. but I think we have to do it, and other states are trying to do it, and um, whether we do that through the social service uh, network, whether, whether we do that through private, Nonprofit partnership. However, it is we do it. We have an obligation to do it. And we will. But um, well, the cat's out the bag now. We know it's a problem, right? right? You you can't pretend it's not there, right? Um, and it's it's an extensive problem. Yes. I'm interested to see how if if you were to start your um, study now, right? The fact that we have the the prevalence of the internet mm -hmm. and so much is being, as you talked about yes. earlier, is being conducted via the internet. Yes. It's, it's off the streets yep. to a large extent yep. now. And yep. How would that affect a study like that? Well, I think you know what we have now is we have the Human Trafficking Task Force that operates in the city, um, and we have the Internet Crimes Against Children unit of the GBI. So my first stops would be with them okay. um, to begin to better understand the role you know, it's again, but it's broadening that focus. It's moving away from looking at this as a street problem, a vice problem, to looking at at it as a, a problem that really is has been multiplied and is more prevalent because of the the ease at which buyer and seller can can engage. I think what we're seeing is less uh, pimp controlled exploitation and far more self exploitation. You know, where an individual is engaging in this sale without um, there being a pimp involved. Um, and whether, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's still not exploitation, but it's just the, the and not even probably the same factors of the wanting that control and that escape and that independence motivating it as well. So I think we have, um, we still have that, that problem. I think um, I'm doing some research now where I think part of and it's where I would shift my focus is I think trying to identify and learn from the victims still through a pathway of identifying either the um, I was just talking with someone from uh, state of Florida the other day who said if you want to know where these victims are they're among my foster care population this is where these are the youth being kind of um, prepared for entry into exploitation because of the state of foster care. And he even invited me to come and do some, re some interviews with the population he has there because Florida has um, uh, adopted a Safe Harbor Act like New York has. And so they're trying to address this problem through the social service system. Um, but so, so getting back to it, I think if we're going to understand this and, and try to get an idea of the pathway, that pathway has mm -hmm. to shift to looking at that population. Still has to address the issues around the role that technology plays in that. Um, but I think it's it's that's where that the largest group lies. Um, the other um, piece and then it's kind of an area I'm shifting to is to to try to identify the population through those that purchase sex with kids and those that sell it. Can you talk a bit about that? Mm -hmm. This is yeah, very interesting. I'm. I'm uh, <laughs> You're very brave. <laughs> well, I'm venturing into a new area and um, I got some funding from Georgia State, uh, seed money, to partner with a colleague in Chicago and we're planning to look at the really the use of technology in the sale and marketing of sex with children. And so we're planning to do um, 
identify through either probation departments, um, through former prostitutes who still are connected with the pimp community, uh, pimps and johns that we can talk to about um, how they communicate with each other and the role that technology plays. So there are websites, um, erotic websites, there is eros.com that allows for um, men to rate the quality of services they've received in the, from the sex industry. And granted, that's all adult, so you know, make no, you know, at least that's, that's what Arrow says. They would never allow for the communication of information if they knew about sale of, or participation of children in this. But, but what we know from the research is that these two worlds, they, they overlap. They're a Venn diagram. So the sale of sex, whether it's with um, somebody of age or under age, is occurring within the same venue. So we're hoping that through analyzing some of the chats that go on there, you can even log in as a user and you can have conversations. Um, we're going to try to go in like, kind of covertly into that arena. We can clearly analyze some of the, some of the conversations that are going on anyway because it's public, it's there, you just log in and you see it. You can go into different cities. Um, so we're going to try to pick up some of the ergo and the language and we're hoping that the pimps and the johns that we interview can help us understand that world on the assumption that that is one of the main ways that they communicate. Now clearly there's non-public discussion. There, you know, there's private chats that are going on that we aren't going to have access to unless we get access to them through the current pimps or johns. It's, it's icky. And how do you make contact with these um, the pimps and the johns? Are they comfortable talking to you? Well, what we're planning to do is um, we have a couple of former prostitutes in each of the cities and, and one or two former pimps that are now supposedly no longer in the life, but still have connections. We're going to ask them to refer people to us, and we will give them a cash incentive to do that. Then of the current, of the active pimps and johns, we will ask them in addition for referrals for which they will get uh, small. It's very, it's small. It's simply enough to make the 30 minute or hour long conversation we have worth their time but not enough to incentivize them to send people to us with bogus information. That was going to be my next right. question. How do you... Um, yeah, and we'll only them? allow them so many referrals. Okay. So, so each person we successfully interview will be able to refer three people to us. And then after that, that's it. We won't take any more from them. And then that's part of the methodology, too, is you don't want to get saturation. And if you want to really get a decent representation, you've got to have this kind of... Um, snowballing effect. Um, and we're presenting it really as a marketing study that we're interested in um, understanding, you know, recognize that they are selling an illicit product um, and that we want to learn the difficulties of doing that, how they overcome those difficulties, and how they are so prosperous at providing this illicit service to the public for a cost. So we're approaching it kind of as a business model. We want to we want to start the conversation as you are entrepreneurs, and you're you're you know you're obviously um, involved in the sale of something that's very difficult to sell. How do you how are you not detected by law enforcement? How do you? So we're approaching it from a business standpoint that we're really interested in. They're really trying to flatter them, and it's not too difficult to flatter a pimp because they have a huge ego. Um, for the most part, and they tend to think that they're very crafty and witty, and so we want to take advantage of that, of their willingness to want to flaunt and brag, um, and it'll be difficult. Um, I'm planning to use a male interviewer because I don't think they'll respond well to me, um, so I'm recruiting some um, a graduate student from the marketing okay. department, uh, probably someone international um, as well. Um, but yeah, so that's our approach. We're hoping to do 25 interviews. And, and we also are, um, because we don't want to rely solely on that referral method, we're going to, um, I've got relationships with the Georgia Department of Corrections. 
and their probation division. So I'm going to interview some who've already be, have been charged with this and have are serving probation terms or prison terms for this, um, and just talk about their past behavior. So I want people who recently have, have okay. gone in, who might have, you know, and I can I can put money in their commissary account if they're in the institution or. Likewise, I can give them a small cash incentive to talk to me. Um, but it definitely wouldn't be from the vantage point of we're trying to develop interventions. So there'll be a little deception yeah. that we use. Um, but, and we'll see, I still have to go through IRB. I was just about to <laughs> ask you that. How do you think so, that's going to fly So now they're going, to, they're going to accuse me not only of protecting, <laughs> but of uh, financially supporting the exploitation of children. <laughs> Do you have to get special permission um, or a dispensation to uh, go on certain sites? Because I, I notify the our attorneys, our um, university attorney, that that's what I'm going to be doing. Yeah, no, I so mean, all of it's public and anyone can look at it. But I know that there are, you know, there's the Internet Crimes Against Children ta and the Human Trafficking Task Force, and I know that they're looking at people who log on and they're looking at IP addresses and. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm not in the headlines in the paper of, you know, university faculty member <laughs> visits, you know, spends 500 hours on erotic website during work hours <laughs> kind of thing. I want them to know that it, it's legitimate. So How long is this um, research going to take? We think? have, well, we're, we have we got funded largely because we our intended supply for federal funding to kind of expand it beyond Atlanta and Chicago into other cities. Um, so we have a year. Um, so we are we've already started doing the public what we can do publicly. So the erotic websites and all of that is public information. We I can I could and I actually have in putting the proposal together already began to have set up an account and have looked at begun to etch out the Argo and the language. Um, but the interviews and the, all, of the, all of that, we still have to go through IRB. Okay. So I'm planning to do that this summer so that we can start in the fall. And I'm hoping that we can do it by, uh, by February. And again, we need about 50 in each um, city. Uh, but you know, it could take me several months to get through IRB if I ever get through IRB. Is it the same approach to talking to Johns as you have talking to pimps? Yes. Okay. Except that obviously they're not marketing. Yeah. Um, but they're and again we're there's this um, issue about whether or not we don't think we're going to tap into the pedophile population and we're not seeking to, largely because pedophiles as a group those that have this um, compulsion um, for sex with young, they're not typically working. I mean, that is a group that's of trafficked children. Don't get me wrong. Um, they're sexually exploited and victimized. Um, but my sense is that that population and everything I've read, the little we know, um, is that they're a very closed group um, and trying to gain access to them very difficult. And we're talking about with the issue or the main area that I've been concerned about are really the older children, adolescent, teens, and those that um, really because of the, um, you know, the, I think it's just a, it's, it's a different form of exploitation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm interested in that kind of, that triangle, that, that you know, pimp, adolescent, um, victimized, uh, or, or you know, pimp John, victim mm -hmm. triangle, um, and then obviously with because if we got into, if we look at the role of tech of technology, um, it's just you know we would, you know, child pornography has just flourished with the onset of the internet. It's just eased so much, um, and so. I'm trying to to kind of differentiate and focus on this one element of um, the trafficking experience. So when we look for Johns, um, we may ask some of the pimps if we can talk to their customers, and and in a sense of you know what it is they like about you know. And again, we'll add a lot of questions into the interview so that they hopefully won't know exactly what it is we're looking for. 
I think it's interesting that you brought up the the sort of differentiation between pedophiles yes. and um, Johns who want to mm -hmm. have sex with just young women. Right. Uh, is anyone doing a, a, a like an intense sort of psychological profiling of the of, of the differences, those differences? between the two? Um, no, they're really the folks that do research on pedophiles are a rather small group. Um, and they often, I mean, because of the clinical basis of that, it's, it's really a dis, almost a disorder of the mind. Um, it tends to be dominated by clinical psychologists, and um, it's, a, it's kind of a different world. And what we what we kind of know, or I think what our concern is about the on the child trafficking side, um, is not that the the pedophiles are not a group to be concerned or worried about, but that that's not where the growth kind of is in the demand um, and so there's a sense that the motive for someone to have sex with someone young is very different from the motive for someone having sex with a child um, and so the strategies and we know a whole lot it's kind of a, a sort of ironic that we know far more about pedophilia than we do about this other population and in some ways it's odd, but in some ways it's not, because <laughs> when we think about the degree to which um, you know, the sex industry has kind of normalized this whole idea mm -hmm. of you know, paying for sex is not perverted or different, or it's, it's um, you know, that there's that, and the mass culture's kind of bought into it in, in many ways. And even to minimize the victimization that occurs in the, in the pimp, prostitute relationship to the degree that we have. Um, and so this idea, and I think the Shapiro group's work suggests that um, you know, these men aren't seeking someone who's 15. You know, they're, they want to have sex with someone, they want it with someone who looks young. And if they, they view that young per, that person they're having sex with as a willing participant, they're not thinking about the degree of coercion, the degree of choice she's exercising, or what her age is. You know, I'm told she's an adult. Hey, she's only 15. Eh, well, you know, she's only 15. Let's but talk a little bit about the Shapiro report. Mm -hmm. How did you think of it when it, it um, was released? Um, I had concerns about the methodology. Uh, and we actually had my team, the research team, it came out, I want to say the final six months that we were working and putting together our report. And I was very interested because I thought, wow, this is you know, phenomenal that we have some information. How did they do it? And oh my gosh, and I was talking with Kathy McCullough and I said, this is just astonishing. How in the world did they, you know, my first thought was, how did they get IRB to approve this? <laughs> that was the first thing I thought. I was like, wow. Um, and, then I, and then as I realized they weren't affiliated with any university, I thought, oh, well, okay. So, they, so they're in the private sector and they don't have IRB concerns. Oh, okay. So they, you know, the outside of the, just the normal ethical constraints that anyone would have and exploring it, they don't have the same hoops to jump through. Um, and initially I thought the numbers were just astonishingly high. Um, and I, and as, when I looked, because granted it was in the wake of our frustration that we couldn't even get the agencies to share if any one of these youth who had experienced commercial sexual exploitation had crossed their doorstep. But now we were finding 200 to 300 girls per month. It's like, where are they? I want, where are they? I just thought, were they hiding? And then they all came out of the bushes? Where, where are they? Uh, so part of it was I was just kind of frustrated that, that, that this was there. And then, and then as I looked at the methodology, I realized how um, I had concerns about the the assumptions and uh, um, the way in which the estimates were generated, the the actual statistical um, estimates. Um, and then I I looked at the methodology that they used to um, through the. Um, they had basically three approaches. One was they went into an area of known prostitution and they videotaped and then they, um, people on the street, and then they asked um, 
independent parties, I don't know how many or what their ages were, or what their gender was or what their race was, to guess the age of a young woman, and it was all women, they didn't do any men, um, young woman was, and if she was under 18, then they counted that as a, if she looked under 18, that she was a, a minor and a victim, and if she was over 18, not. And then they, based on those reviews, they got an estimate of the number of girls on the street. And then they did an internet ad where they set up what was, I guess would be a honeypot, for lack of a better term. And they had men call in, um, and then they asked questions about um, uh, whether or not, you know, they had, there's lingo and argo in the field about how to get access to younger prostitutes. And um, so they would press them as to, well, you know, you want someone young. Well, young, yeah. Well, how young? You know, trying to get them to reveal whether or not they actually wanted sex with a minor versus not. Um, and then um, the third way, was it the hotels that they sat in? They've used a number of different methodologies over time. But, so anyway, they had come up with these numbers. And then as I looked at the translation, there was a, um, and we actually talked with Alex, who led the study with the Shapiro group. He came and shared, or we did a phone conversation with him, I believe, because my team looked at the study that first came out and said, oh my gosh, this, 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 this. We had a list of concerns we had, and how did you go from here to here? And um, Anyway. At the end of it, um, my biggest concern was that by setting up the honeypot, that they were actually shaping the market. Yeah. Um, that if men became aware that, oh, well, you don't have to go with that 19-year-old, that there's actually a place that you can go and get someone under 18 who's younger and fresher and newer, less likely to have, the, that they were, by setting up the honeypot, cr shaping the very market they were studying, and so how many men simply went to a younger population because it was available, but were more than happily and content with an older one before, right? So I had a concern about that, <laughs> um, which they didn't have, uh, which kind of shocked me. Um, and then there was an issue around their interpretation of what I would call kind of request for services or, or an incidence versus the prevalence, right? So there's a number of victims that experience this, but then there's a number of times that men have sex with, right? And they were confusing the two. So they counted um, every, you know, if a man is willing, wants to have sex with someone 10 times a day, they're counting that as 10 different victims, rather than recognizing that it could be the exact same victim having sex 10 times, right? So so those issues, and so I think their, their numbers are conflated in that they, they confuse incidents and prevalence. Um, but I think, you know, all, I'm saying all this in the context that, in acknowledging that they got a, at least a picture of something that we struggled for three months to get. Now, they didn't have the same constraints, and we didn't have the resources they had. <laughs> but, you know, with all those caveats, I'm, I'm pleased that they did it because it generated a conversation. Um, I do have concerns ethically about what they did. Um, but, you know, again, they're in a private sector marketing firm, um, and they can do that. Um, I can't, and I wouldn't. So, um, so I, you know, I, I respect those differences. That, that that's what's there, um, and I do think they've helped. Um, I wish they would look at the at the male population. I, I, I still, I will ding them on that probably till I go to my grave because <laughs> they had the opportunity to do it. But again, uh, given the funding, the origination of the funding source, and this is coming through the Juvenile Justice yeah. Fund, again, it's, I think they were, they were perhaps hamstrung by the same parameters that we were, and that if you're going to work with us, we're only interested in girls and don't look any further. Um, but I think it's generated a, a conversation. Clearly, their methodology has been adopted in some other states. And I think it does give us a different look at a different piece of the elephant. And I like that they brought in the, the and have highlighted the importance that the, the role the internet plays in this and that the marketing is no longer at the street level, 
Um, I just wish they clean a little bit up with the, the cyan. They say it's a scientific study, and my concern is it's not replicatable. We, they didn't, you know, the very sites and the stuff, they didn't document it well enough that they could give me that data or another scholar that data and say, you go ahead and analyze it and see what you come up with. Yeah, I guess it's proprietary information for them, and so they didn't. But without doing, to me, science has to be replicatable, and I have to be able to defend the claims I'm making. And I just think they're on shaky ground because they can't do that. That's all. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think it's creative what they've done. And um, I think that was my first response when I read the, yeah. the report was yes. like how, how difficult it is to somehow get to those yep. um, people. Yes. Um, and, and it really right. was a very creative way of doing yes. it. It's in, in some ways kind of brave. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I to, think so. And I, I remember talking with Alex and I said, gosh, if you want to try to get this published, let's try to get it published, you mm -hmm. know. And that's when I realized you didn't keep track of everything you did, did you? Like they didn't print the screens and they didn't document the who who the raiders were, and they did. So there's basic things about you know reliability, validity, replication that's inherent in the scientific mind that I just think wasn't in their game plan for whatever reason. And granted, I understood why they did it. This was a contract they did, and it's and it's had a tremendous impact. I just wish it could stand on stronger legs, yeah. that's all. I think because it was so creative and because it had really the potential to kind of rock the world, and instead of rocking the world, they got tremendous pushback because of those fundamental flaws. And that, and I think they were unavoidable. I don't think they needed to be there, do you know what I mean? Because they aren't operating in the same parameters that I have to. And because they are a proprietary organization, they can do this, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they could do it. They could have done it in a way that challenges. Could have said, "Okay, well, here is the data. You look at it and see if you get different numbers, right?" And they just—it's a missed opportunity. Well, you just need to be involved next time you do something <laughs> like that. I don't know. I don't know if they welcome me to the table. <laughs> anyway, you're a little upset with me because I—I was kind of critical of them. In, uh, yeah, I just—I mean. I guess because I care so much about this, it's like, gosh, if I had that opportunity, if I could work without those parameters, you know? That IRB. And yeah, I'm sure the people the people at IRB are like, oh no, here's Mary Finn again. What are we going to get from her? <laughs> well, that was the thing I ran into um, a vi our former vice president for research, and he said, oh, I saw your name on another one of those projects around this uh, child trafficking stuff. He goes, when are you going to learn? And I just said, I know. I just... You know, I think it's an important area. I think we just got to try to understand what's going on. Um, so, yeah, my husband's not thrilled either that I'm going <laughs> to I, I had a lot of sleepless nights on that, on the other one. Well, and I, 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 really I, I, something that's really important to, um, to think about is the, the um, effect that it has on you emotionally oh, yeah. and on your family. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how do you decompress after you've... Um, and how do you process all of that awful stuff? Yeah, I mean, the one area that's kind of, it's, in, it's just an aside, one day I was walking to the, um, down here to the Marta station, and I went by, walked by on this little isolated area, there was a young man standing in front of this young girl, she's probably 13, and he was just degrading her and talk, and I was there long enough to capture that this was a pimp or a boyfriend who had forced her to do something she didn't want to do and it was sex related. So I'm like, here it is, it's unfolding in front of me, right? And so I, and shortly down the block there was a group of um, young men and uh, this man had struck her. And I was, that was when I said, no, I, this is not, I can't, I just can't walk away. So I went down to the guys at the end of the block and I said, did you just see what I saw? And they're all looking at me and, what? And I said, that man just struck her. I said, how old do you think she is? I bet you have a sister that age. And you're gonna stand here and watch that and not do anything? I said, I know your mother raised you better than that. You need to get down there and you, I said, I'm gonna phone the police, I'm gonna let them know, but you need to get down there and make sure that nothing more happens. And one of the guys was just like, told me to, you know what? Uh -huh. And another one, I'm just looking, I caught his eye, and I just said, you know, 
you need to step up. And so I went down to the Marta, and the timing was that there were two police, Atlanta City of Atlanta police officers coming down, because I guess someone else must have phoned it in. And um, I said, you know, there's a guy down there, just struck a young woman. And um, I said, you know, it's, I'm trying to get some, some bystanders to intervene. And he goes, well, what does he look like? And I said, well, he's got, you know, dreadlocks, and he's this high. And he goes, oh, yeah, we got it, we got it. And they were actually heading there, right? So I got onto the, I was on getting on the Marta and I texted my husband and, and I said, <laughs> well, I think I just intervened and prevented a pimp from getting away with hitting um, a young woman. And he's like, what are you doing? You can study this, but you don't have to take this on as your own. What are you gonna do, go out and be an interrupter now? And I said, no, you know, I'm okay, it's fine. The police are there. He, and he, so he just goes, Phew. But it, it, I mean, it's hard to kind of study this stuff and realize that it is happening in our midst. And it's not just this issue, it's other issues where we see people bullied, we see abusive language, um, we see rudeness, and we just let it go. Sure, yeah. We just, it's not my business, I'm going to just walk out for myself and not, and I can't be that person anymore. And I just, it's, I've just studied it too much. I've seen it unfold in even in academic departments where there's been negative behavior that's clearly affected the quality of life in that department. I can't stand by and not do something. Um, but it comes with a cost. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, I, I wish I could not intervene and <laughs> just walk away sometimes, but I feel like I've had this epiphany. Um, that you know, my eyes have been opened, and I won't, I won't be able to live with myself if I don't do. I mean, I'm not a risk taker. I didn't intervene. I didn't, you know, put him to the ground. I, you know, <laughs> too old to do that now. Um, my younger years, if I had the same mentality, I probably would be very dangerous and get myself in harm's way. But, um, but it's, it's, uh, it is hard. And I have two children. I have, you know, that are. I started studying this issue, especially worried about my son more than, you know, he works at a restaurant and he's been propositioned by men. Um, you know, it's just something I always thought and talked about with my daughter, but I never thought of talking about it with my son. And it, it's just like, really? Well, hmm. you know, one time it was a man and one time it was a woman. And I was like, does she know? Does he know that you're only 16? I mean, we're having this conversation with him. And he's like, oh, mom, I just threw it in the trash. It's no big deal. And I'm like, gosh. You know, but so <laughs> it's, you know, having that and, and uh, you know, it, it's not easy. It, it's not easy. And um, it's partly, you know, I had, I would survive sexual abuse as a child. And so I had made a commitment to myself in my career that, you know, I'm, I can study most anything, but I don't think I can study this. And now I find myself studying it. And when I find that I can't get, it's one of the reasons I didn't want to do the one-on-one -on -one interviews with the youth is that I was afraid I would over-identify with them. And I didn't want to do that um, for a host of reasons. I wasn't sure I was ready, and I wasn't sure that it was the healthiest thing for them. and. Um, but I, I was okay with it, and I did it, and I heard, and I think I can empathize with a clearly different situation. It wasn't a stranger, it was a family member. But it's, it's still um, not something that I, I mean, I, I'm not sure I want to dive into it real full, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't want to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews with victims, um, and if I can avoid it, I probably will. But I think I have a heightened sensitivity to it because of my experiences. And what I, what I hope is that, and I share with my students sometimes and my graduate students when I teach family violence and all, that it's important for those who have been victims and who have survived, like I see myself as a survivor, that they see that you can go on in life and that you can be a full person. And it's not to minimize that experience at all. It's just not to allow it to identify who you are. Yeah. And they need to see people that can do that. Yeah. And I think it's powerful. I mean, I think the mayor, when she shared her experiences and, you know, that, you know, look at what she was able to accomplish. And I think we need more people like that being willing to just say, you know, we're all walking wounded. Yeah. 
we all have things that happen to us in our lives and it's not that event that defines us it's how we move forward having experienced it mm -hmm. and um, you know being and I think I mean I look at everybody and think there's something about them in their life that they there was a challenge that they overcame big or small and mine is no different from that and I just want to be able to do that and I think with these youth particularly who maybe haven't seen a lot of that success that they know that there's that they can overcome and that they can set it walk a different pathway and then what that pathway is mm -hmm. you know and it doesn't have to be a pathway to addiction and it doesn't have to be the pathway to delinquency and crime it can be something different you know, it's not going to come easy yeah but it can yeah. That's a great message. Yeah. How do you have a give with all of this at, in your background then, mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with the realities of what predators or, mm -hmm. or um, you know, pimps, um, Johns, mm -hmm. are, are, you know, the, what they're doing to young, young people? I hate it. I hate it. Boy, it makes my blood boil. I don't have a lot of empathy. Um, but I think it's a difference in degree that I see in them. Um, from the potential of, I think, every human being to be to go to that negative side, to take advantage, to manipulate, um, to exploit. I think it's in all of us. I just, you know, I tend to see it in men more than women, but that's my bias. And I think it's part of the power differential that exists in our society, that the avenues for men to be able to get in positions to be able to do that are much greater. But I've seen women do it too. So I just, I'm like an anti-bully, anti, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, I try every, in every venue I have to make sure that those behaviors don't get evidenced. Um, and then I speak out against them when I see them. But other than that, I don't, I don't know much more to do. I, um, it's one of the reasons I won't be doing the interviews uh, with the pimps and the Johns, and why it's hard for me to reframe this in a way, um, because my my sense and my own morality of all of it is, oh, you know, how low you are. Um, but I think again, we have to be able to have those conversations. Yes. Um, I think in, in part it's like there's there's the victimization but there's also like it's it's all tied up with one of the most cynical forms of greed I think I've ever ever encountered where yes. you're you're selling human beings yes again and again and again mm -hmm. um, so you can make money right um, and to get to the point where you don't see anything wrong with them mm -hmm. you know and I know that in some of these individuals they have histories of abuse themselves they're wounded as well but it's how they've transformed that you know, uh, wound into something that creates further harm. Yeah. That to me is just not, that I can't do. You know, that, that I can't quite understand. And I can't justify it or find a rationalization for it. There has to be other, other ways in which you can. Um, so move moving forward with this, this research that you're going to be doing, do you have in, in your, somewhere in the back of your mind, how you will, um, process this through emotionally, you know, how you go home at the end of the day and be able to just like yeah. leave it behind. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of journaling when I do research because it helps me. I do it more than, than at any other time, especially when I'm, it's new data, when it's, you know, primary data collection, you tend to know what, don't know what you're going to get when you open that box. Um, so I do a lot of that. And then I have, you know, if I need to, I'll go into counseling. Okay. I mean, I'll work through it that way. I make sure that I keep my diet and exercise. And when I do new projects, my husband's wonderful because I share with him what it's about. And I said, I need you to keep a kind of a look-see on me. Make sure that I'm, you know, I'm not drinking too much. <laughs> if I, you know, I mean, all those things that I'm, you know, not that I am sleeping um, and that I'm not being too distant because what I tend to do is get in my own little world and I'll withdraw socially if I you know so I recognize these things and so having someone look at it if I was with a team of people like we were with when we did the original 
project, we were doing that for each other. You know, we would debrief on things. I'll probably debrief with my colleague from Chicago about it. Um, and it's a woman that I'll be working with, and we've worked in the past. So we both know that we're kind of going into this, this realm. Um, but that's the only way I know to do is to try to make sure I have those kind of safety valves. And, um, and if I find I can't do it, then, I'll, then I just won't. Yeah. I mean, this is the first time I'm moving into kind of directly working with the, with the abusive side. I haven't done that in the research I've done on with women or even with um, the witnessing the children who witness violence. Yeah. So this is my shift into that offender population and I don't know how I feel about it, um, but we'll see. I think it's actually very academically and emotionally brave of you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, or it's foolhardy, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, a year from now I'll be, you know, I don't know, totally. I don't know, but it's, um, I think it's, I mean, I think it's an interesting question. I think I'll be able to handle it. We'll see. Good. We'll see. I want to ask you, changing the subject a little bit, um, you've been working on research about the health out outcomes of, um, among women who are trafficked for sex. Yes. I'm, there's no, I've not seen very much about that written. No. There hasn't been. What are you finding? Well, we relied on, we didn't do any primary data collection with this project. There was a study that was funded by the Department of Justice that collected data in, I want to say it was about eight U.S. cities. Um, and it was um, a mix of international and domestic victims who were identified through um, some um, nonprofit organizations that reached out to uh, women who were involved in prostitution. Um, so it's a mix. Um, Hughes, I'm forgetting the, I'm forgetting the source of the data. So I'm gonna do that. Um, but we, so they collected information on about, I want to say, 60 or 70 women, adult women. And they asked them kind of a range of questions about their experiences, and they also captured some information on um, the health outcomes. So things related to mental illness, physical um, victimization during the you know the course of their trafficking, um, and then what we were trying to do was they hadn't looked closely at things like some of the public health research has begun to differentiate among this um, issue of prostitution of adults, the women that engage in it voluntarily, so don't have a pimp, um, whether that's how they entered the life or ultimately it's kind of the status they've achieved, that they're independent versus not being forced or exploited commercially um, through, through a pimp. And that they've tried to look at the health outcomes and the differences in those experiences, with the idea being that someone who's um, kind of involved or their entry into prostitution is through this coercion would have far negative, ne more negative health outcomes than women who, you know, you hear the stereotypes, you know, the women who um, are the, the sugar mamas or whatever of, uh, of, of wealthy men. And um, so they, the public health realm has, has looked at that. They've also looked at issues around um, if it's indoor versus outdoor. So women who are out on the street um, considered to be a lower class of prostitute because they're kind of marketing their wares and are exposed to so many other risks for oh, yeah. being on the street than women who are kept in, in brothel or hotel, right? Um, and so they began to, to differentiate that. So we thought we would look at, um, there was one other factor we examined too, I'm blanking on it right now. But, but all of this was kind of conversation going on in the public health research and going on really with prostitution, prostitution often in some countries where it was legal. Um, so Canada, for instance, and, and some other nations. Um, and so we thought, well, why don't we look at this with the U.S. population, domestic and international, um, and figure out 
whether or not the health outcomes are differing in a context where it is illegal. And, um, you know, let's see what we find. So, so what we end up finding, um, we also looked, oh, the other factor we looked at was um, we wanted, we, we, my colleague and I, Lisa, who looked at, who did this study, are seeing, understanding pimp behavior as being on a continuum that may not be that much different from other types of controlling relationships. So and one thing we learned, or I learned in looking at youth, is that a lot of times the youth are recruited into this through um, the pimp posing as someone who genuinely is interested in a dating relationship, in an intimate relationship, a partnership of some sort. And that when we, so that's not unlike some intimate partner violence where this is a relationship that is about control and it's about um, force and coercion and abuse, physical and verbal. And so there are parallels between pimp behavior and batterer behavior that we thought we would look at. And so one of the factors that we wanted to examine with this population was the degree to which there were other abusive relationships besides the physical victimization. So the degree of verbal abuse. And again, it's interesting because, as you know, among women who are in intimate partner violence, they often report that the physical abuse, while awful and difficult and harmful, it's really the verbal abuse that they find to be most detrimental to them, that pushes them emotionally to the edge and has them engage in self-harm, drug use, I mean, anything to escape, not the physical, but the verbal abuse. And so we thought that would be an interesting thing to look at with this group as well. And so what we found was um, that um, pimp-controlled um, behavior, or pimp-controlled experiences had, the women that were in those types of situations had far poorer health outcomes, okay. which you would somewhat expect. Um, in addition, we did find that those who reported higher levels of verbal abuse also had poor health outcomes, even when we controlled for their extent of uh, physical victimization, whether it was physical victimization on the part of the pimp or the john, right, because we have both kind of types going on. Um, and so we just, you know, overall when we looked at, and we looked at a, a number of different, we had um, all different types of mental health symptoms, drug um, use, alcoholism, um, pregnant, um, unwanted pregnancies, STDs, across the board, the women that were kind of in this non-voluntary trafficked situation had overall poorer health experiences than those. And international victims, though they were younger as well, they had control for um, their age, they had far, compared to the domestic population, far fewer poor health outcomes. So their health, they were healthier, um, didn't report the extent of um, physical victimization or abuse at the hands of Johns or at pimps. Um, it was just that it, the nature of their experiences was different. But again, these were younger women in comparison to the domestic population where it was older women that, that were part of the study. Now, the, the, the who was interviewed, not representative, very much a convenient sample, so we don't know the degree to which this is generalizable to, um, you know, to, to, the, to the population overall. Um, but there's so few studies and information out there that we had this small group of women, we said, well, let's just look at it because no one else has really looked at it. And it's surprising that we don't look at these health outcomes beyond, you know, we, we've studied prostitution and trafficking, but we never really look at the, what are the real tangible mm -hmm. um, outcomes of that life. It's pretty sad. Yeah, I, it, I, it kind of shocks me that, that this is something that's been so ignored. Yeah, and if we look at we look at it in every other population but the U.S., right, because I don't, it's weird. <laughs> it's really, really strange. And we learned so much about what's going on in Canada and in Britain and, you know, even, I mean, obviously Thailand and some Asia, some of our Asian, the, our, the Asian countries, but we don't know a whole lot about 
what this is like, um, this kind of experience for women, though we know it's been happening for a period of time. Um, so, How long um, did the, this research go on for for you? Oh, we did this in about three months. Okay. So, <laughs> so we had existing data, and we um, we um, there was a there was actually a um, at one of our journals, one of our premier journals, was looking for information on the health outcomes of justice involved of of being a victim of being an offender, and they really wanted to focus on health outcomes. So we said, well, gosh, this is ideal. Let's here's this data. Um, Let's go ahead and analyze it and submit it. And we did, and it got rejected because it wasn't a large enough number. Um, and we said, okay, well, let's send it to Public Health Journal, see what if they like it. It got rejected for other reasons. And then we said, okay, well, let's try one other place. And so now we have, I think this was a revise and resubmit still. Okay. So we are, it hasn't been published yet. But we're hoping we address their concerns about um, obviously some of the statistics, statistical analysis, because it's a small number. Um, we had to do some confidence intervals, and we had to make sure we had enough power in the analysis for some of the things that we were looking at. And so we did that. Um, so I think it will be accepted. We got the revisions back in, but um, can you see yourself maybe doing a broader um, study at some point? in the future? Oh, yes. Because uh, it, it just seems like something that, that yes. needs to be done. I mean, and there may be some information. Some states actually do some um, health, uh, community health surveys where they actually ask women about their sexual activity. Um, some of them even ask, I and mean, we've obviously, you know, protected use of prote protection um, during sex. I mean, that was one of the factors we looked at as well. Um, but so they have some, there's, there's a study in California, it's a pretty large study, that actually has some data on women who um, were engaged in prostitution or sale of sex for money, asking them if, about whether or not there was someone that forced them or forced them into doing this, that hasn't really looked at the health outcomes fully, even though it was a health study. It was kind of weird. Um, I don't know what they were looking for. But we have this obsession with, um, well, with the whole issue of STDs and AIDS and its spread. And a lot of the prostitution related research has focused on those protective measures that are taken. And they haven't really looked at the other pieces of it. The mental health piece, especially. Right. Uh, right. I, I, you know. I mean, but I think it's because they're, they're concerned about the spread of that yeah. disease that they developed this, we're gonna focus on this because there, there was wrongly this perception that um, prostitutes were the ones that were not only spreading, but they were the ones who originated it. The reality was, it wasn't them, it was their, the Johns who were the ones who were the originators of it. And the, if, you know, so it, it, it kind of created this, um, this place, this blame on the prostitute rather than on the Johns. So, yeah. Got to love it. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, was it last year we passed the human trafficking mm -hmm. uh, legislation here in Georgia? What did you think of that? I think it's um, a good step. Um, I, like, um, I like how it's modeled. I like the language of it. I think it's, I think it's a very um, positive development. My my one concern about it um, is the language suggests, um, well, it does a lot to transition us from looking at um, these you know, youth who engage in sex for money as criminals to, to victims. It clearly puts them in that category. But it, it makes that access to services conditional on their willingness um, to support um, efforts on the justice system's part to hold their pimps and or Johns or whomever else is involved in that transaction accountable. Mm -hmm. And I think that I have a problem with that. Um, I have a problem with that because they're not adults. Yep. They're children. Um, and while you, um, I know it's modeled after the adult trafficking legislation where, and I think it might be even there, 
there, to me, there's much stronger ground to say as an adult, there is this expectation that you will help. Um, and if you don't, then there are certain services you may not qualify for. I still not real comfortable with that because to me, you're a victim regardless. And again, it's this issue of trusting the person who's experienced that trauma and helping them work through that to the point where they can make a decision about whether they want to help you or not. And I know there's timeliness mm -hmm. in trying to respond quickly, but at the end of the day, in these kinds of situations, our attention has to be, and our focus has to be on, on the victim and not on the offender. And my problem with our current law is that it still shifts that focus on trying to get that offender. And granted, I want to get them too, but I don't want us to have bodies strewn along the way of victims in order to do that. And for children especially, because who's going to act on their behalf? Who are they going to consult with to make this decision? Are we going to have guardian ad litems that will help? Maybe. But even then, it's a tremendous, difficult decision to place in the hands of a child who's just gone through this traumatic Yes. I mean, it just, I don't understand the logic of it. And our federal law doesn't require it for services for child victims. It requires it for adults, but not for children. So why did we add it as a, as a need to have this as a precursor to qualifying for resources? It doesn't make sense to me. I'm, I, the cynical part of me um, thinks that it's, it was, you know, it was politics Probably. to make sure that it got it pleased everybody enough to get passed. Although it, it was really right. quite astonishing how, how um, both sides of the house were able to come together. and. Um, oh, I was amazed. Uh, From where we were a year this. ago yeah. to what we just passed, yeah. light years. Yeah. Um, and I also think it may be an issue of federal funds may be available or more readily available if you have a victim who's participating in the process that that might open up um, some resources so that the state and local communities don't have to support it, but I still think it's not the right tone. A, a lot of people um, who are far more intelligent than I am, who I've talked to about this this legislation, see it kind of as a step in the right direction. Right. I think it is, um, and I actually I crafted an op-ed piece for the AJC um, in response to it. That kind of. Um, I didn't send it in. I kind of chickened out because I, <laughs> I've always. I mean, I feel like I've. I every time the state does something, I'm always like, oh, like, a little, just a little more, just a little more. And that's the academic in me, kind of seeing like what that horizon where we could be, and getting frustrated that we're just we're still at this hill. So I have to kind of restrain myself sometimes. But I had written a piece, kind of, you know, saying this is a wonderful first step. However. You know what we really need you know and this piece in particular is troublesome um, but I wasn't sure what the politics were behind it all and at the time I thought we need to have just a day where we just go yay this is good rather than you know this is good but I didn't want to be the person that did the but um, so but I, I do intend to try to do everything I can to try to get that revised yeah because I think it's just, it's just unconscionable to me that yeah. you would place that on a child. Well, and, and the terminology is changing. As time goes on, um, we, we talk now much more about human trafficking. It's yes. the, the, the sort of big umbrella term that we have. Are you comfortable with that? Or are you afraid or worried that the child sex trafficking could be lost mm -hmm. in amongst that? Yeah, I, I am concerned about putting all of this under the umbrella of human trafficking. Because I do think, while I'm a staunch human rights advocate, um, I think when we parcel out and try to just lump children under that umbrella, we, we miss a conversation about agency, about legal status, about who speaks for the child. I mean, we lose that and the uniqueness and the vulnerable position that children are in because of their age. I mean, it's not the same. It's just, it's not, the remedies aren't the same, the experience is not the same. It just, it's just different. Um, and it, so we have to have the ability to kind of 
recognize that we have put children because of their age and a particular legal status, we've restrained their ability to do so much, right? It doesn't apply to adults. And, we, and every time we kind of lump them in, we run the risk of forgetting that. Um, and we can't forget it. And again, I think it's part of the, the, the age of this movement. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I'm thrilled that, that the world is looking at human trafficking. Yes. And acknowledging that, that it's there and that it's yep. very serious and that something needs to be done with it. Um, but it's, it's, it is kind of very easy for, for mm -hmm. things to be lost in the, in the, you know, the, the, the grand sweep yes. of things. Um, very much so. Very so. much so. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's times when you have to look at the uniqueness of mm -hmm. the person. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think it's important to see, the, to see beyond the trauma. My fear is that the trafficking experience defines, yep. and it's the common link, but it's not what's going to be, you know, the solution comes in looking at the individual, not in the trauma. And if all you see is the trauma, that individual's never going to move beyond it, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's it do, separating those two things, yeah. that event and then that, that person from the event. Where from now, you know? Exactly. Where do you go from here yep. to make sure that that person has a, um, a better life from, mm -hmm. from where they've been? Yeah. Um, what do you see happening in Georgia within the next sort of five years? Well, I think what um, what is interesting is that we're a little ahead of other states in this in this arena, which is we don't often get to say, but as a state that that we're kind of addressing something that other states haven't, um, in a way that's actually helpful and not hurtful. And then so so those things I'm just like wow, you know this is wonderful. Um, I think the challenges for us, though, are the challenges that other states are, are and, and states that are maybe a little ahead of us are experiencing, and that is the whole how 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 do we build in a network or continuum of care for these youth that allows them to become full functioning adults, um, and what will that cost in a time when resources are just tremendously tight for all kinds of social problems. That, that we're trying to address and acknowledge. Um, I think it's, I mean, what's unfolded now is this kind of public-private partnership that I'm not sure is sustainable. Um, I think it, I think we, as much as I applaud the role that the nonprofit community has played in this and the faith community and all of that, and I know I'm in the South, and I know as a region we tend to res try to, you know, respond with as informally as we can and keep government as minimal as possible, I think it's got to get involved. I, just, I mean, in the office of, um, the, the Governor's Office on Family and Children's, great, wonderful, but their initiatives have all been directed towards trying to expand private sector and, and maybe that's a trend we're, you know, a period we're in. I, I tend not to think not though, but I just don't, I don't think that the degree of resources that this population is going to need to move forward, we even have a sense of how much that is or what it is. Because you're talking about the whole person in a way that's a much longer time commitment than we have for, for other youth at the level of trauma and the, what they're going to need. I just think it's, they're just a tremendously needy population and how we do that and how we navigate through that and what agency does that all has to be determined. And we can look at New York and we can look at Florida for some models. We can look at Washington State for some models. But we'll have to figure out what works here in our context and it may not be the same. Yep. Um, but I hope we're open to it and I hope that, you know, cool minds will prevail and, um, and we'll do it. Um, I think we also have the issue of trying to address, um, you know, the interface between the international and the domestic populations, and um, especially in our state, and um, and how we do that, um, and do it wisely without 
being competitive um, will be telling. <laughs> um, but I mean, I see, you know, I'm optimistic about this issue. And uh, I think, especially with the governor behind it, I hope that, that we maintain a focus on it. Yeah. I, I think I've talked to you about this before. I think it's important that um, as an archivist, I approach all of you who are working on it on a regular basis mm -hmm. going forward because it, it has come a long way, but it's, it's, got, right. it's going to change. And it's important that we sort of talk about those changes as they're going on. Um, so every few years, mm -hmm. actually talking to, to you to sort of yeah. um, check in. Yes. Um, yeah. I think would be a really good idea. Yeah. I mean, I think the solutions, um, especially because a lot of the problems being fostered by technology and uh, how we how we communicate and evolve as a community and how the cyber world becomes for some people the dominant world of their existence. I mean, all of that's unfolding at the same time as it's unfolding. So I think the solutions rest in embracing that kind of new world order, so to speak. And I, th I think it's the young, like my daughter's generation yeah. that's gonna have to bring, you know, the more that we, and being part of the university community is great for this, but the more students are aware and get involved and care and th this is th these are their, you know, closest in age peers, little younger, but they're, you know, they're their siblings that are, that are at risk for this, that their solutions are the ones, their voice has to come to the table in this. Because I feel like when I'm looking at it, I have these old, you know, old values and responses and solutions that just this new community just may not accept. But one yeah. of the great things you're doing is you're teaching. Yes. And you know, you're, you're, yes. you're establishing, um, a, you know, a long sort of trail of, of yes. young people who can then take right. this on and move forward with it. Yeah, I mean, in my recent class, I have a, one of them was a Atlanta police, city police officer, and so he's planning to develop a whole training curriculum um, around this issue and rolling it out, and um, because he said one of the things I've noticed is there's always somebody new that comes in, and then we lose ground, and we lose ground, and it feels like we're spinning our wheels on it. And it's like, well, you know, you're a lieutenant now. You set it in place. Yeah. You get the infrastructure. Uh -huh. Um, and so I'm working with him and a couple other um, people that I brought in for the class, so we're trying to help him build that. So it's not an appendage, it's not just at the training center, but it's actually a part of what they do as an agency. That's great. Yeah, so I mean, there's things like that that can, that can unfold, and you know, students doing internships with Street Grace. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there's a, a college, oh, and I can't for the life of me remember it right now, who are, they're teaching a course. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like a, at least a semester long or it's a, um, on human trafficking. Okay. Um, I think it's a Christian college. Okay, good. Uh, they have representatives at a conference I went to. Okay. So it, it seems like right. um, the academy is, is yes. really stepping up. And, and, and my colleague at, at Loyola, mm -hmm. they have a course on it. And actually, I've been, there's a website that has a, kind of a, um, a stockpile information on human trafficking syllabi and oh, content great. yes um, so and you can imagine this across the board and stuff it's, you know, wow. a lot of things taught in a lot of different departments with a range of issues so it's quite a soup but um, yeah I think it's I mean I think it is a defining issue for this generation I really do um, and it, it, obviously globalization um, helps advance that perspective, um, but it's, I think it, it, it's probably our biggest challenge. Well, and it's, so it's as we said earlier, it's, it's an issue that has, um, if there's anything that you could call a silver lining about it, it's um, in a very fractured society, we're actually able to have conversations about this and we all agree right. it's a very bad thing and we all need to work on it together. Yes. Yes. And we can, we, we can talk to each other about this mm -hmm. um, and that, that is, is very reassuring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. There are not many silver linings about this issue though, realistically. No, <laughs> no. it's pervasive, widespread, um, been around for a long time 
we finally have a name for it um, that we can all agree on but now it's uh, yeah I have one last question for you mm -hmm. and I ask this of everybody it's the last question okay. do you consider yourself to be a feminist yes and why well when I look at the the principles and tenets of what I've learned feminism to be they're things that I value okay. so and I don't shy away from it at all um, and uh, but I try to be because you know clearly when teaching in criminal justice a number of uh, my students are yeah they're fairly conservative um, and this isn't even a male or female thing I have a mix of I have some men who are just so uh, their beliefs are so fit with feminist ideals and I have some women who are just so in rejection of it um, so it's interesting uh, to see but um, it's I mean I definitely see myself that way I am concerned that there seems to be a tarnish to what it means to be a feminist um, but I won't ever shy away from it at all yeah. and uh, I've had that kind of epiphany that this is who I am and this is what I believe and I can't go back to not it would be like denying my own existence in some way my own experiences in life mm -hmm. to not believe it you'd just so. be bullied then yeah exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. well but the, I'm done that, okay, good. Is, is there anything you need to add you? I don't think so I mean I hope you got enough information and I hope I gave you know do um, dignity to to what I've experienced and, and what I've shared and what I've learned. I think this this um, interview is outstanding. I think good. that it will be very, very useful for research. Oh, good. Um, good. I'm glad. No, no worries about that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome.